Good evening. I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Shuttle City Council to order. By roll call, see that six of our council members are present tonight. We have a council member, Grant Clark, who's uh, be, be via, uh, I don't know, wait, you got a phone or something down there tonight. So he'll be able to hear and, and participate in the, in the decision making process tonight as well. Would like to welcome those of you who are here with us uh, in the audience tonight as well as those who may be watching tonight on Sholo TV or some other means of uh, broadcast. We have a special guest tonight. I want to introduce you guys to Flat Stanley, okay? Flat Stanley was sent to me by my grandson, Bruin Hansen. And the way this works is I'm supposed to take this guy for the last six weeks or so everywhere I go and do things and, and write about it and send a little collage back. So he's doing his civic duty tonight, okay? So that's Flat Stanley here. So. Glad to have him with us, you know, as getting involved. Uh, I just want to say thank you for those that are here tonight. We're grateful that you're here in public and, and be able to hear your voices concern. And as we follow the agenda tonight, we'll explain a little bit more about this meeting and, and the process here of the public hearing. We'd like to begin by an invocation. I will offer that, followed by tonight we'll have a video of the National Anthem by Sholo Biz Choir. Those who'd like to join with us, uh, please stand. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to meet together in the city of Sholo. We're grateful for the citizens and those people who live within this community. We're grateful for the health and the strength that we've enjoyed through this pandemic. And for those people who have been able to put forth the very best of citizens and very best in medicine and the very best care in helping one another. And we are grateful for the efforts and for the decisions that we're making as a community. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to live in a nation that's free, that we've gone through a political process and we pray that we might be able to come together as a country, stand united and be able to do the best that's within our Abilities as citizens. As much as we have a, a topic tonight, we pray that we might have thy guidance and direction, that we might be able to have wisdom beyond the mean, our own. We might be able to make decisions that are will affect this community that will be good for the whole. We're grateful unto thee. We're grateful for those who fight in our armed service. We're grateful for those who represent us and sacrifice daily. We're grateful for these community members who have fasted and donated in the community fast and for the efforts, the blessing, the lives of those who have a little less. And as we turn towards the season of holidays and giving and Christmas, we pray that we might remember the and strive to do the things that we can do to be kinder, and to be better citizens. And we ask for thy guidance and direction this night in all that we do and give thee thanks in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, and thank you to Showbiz Choir. They wanted to come and perform in person tonight, but we knew we'd have a crowd, and due to social distancing and some uh, restraints, uh, we asked them to send a video. We want to remind you about the uh, thing that they're doing, the festival that they put forth, the, what's it called? Feast of Carols have done years for years, and I think she'll share that a little later here, but it was fantastic. So our first item we have is call to the public. Uh, this is not the public hearing, so we will open that later, but anybody that has a matter that's not on the agenda tonight, uh, this is the time if you'd like to share that uh, call to the public, know that your comments are limited to three minutes. So we'll open call to the public at this time. Seeing nobody moved, call the public. I'll close call the public and come back to special events. We have a presentation by Sholo High School Choir Showbiz, okay? So at this time we have a Josh Kittle, and student director for Feast of Carols. Josh, come on up. Introduce who's with you. I don't have, have her name. I'm Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm Josh Kittle, and um, this is Sierra, and we're the, I'm the King of the Highlands, and she's the Queen of the Highlands in the upcoming 36th Annual Feast of Carols on December 9th through 12th. Um, there are five shows this year. The Dessert Night on December 9th, tickets are $9. Um, the Dinner Shows on the 10th through 12th, tickets are $22. And there's a soup and salad matinee on the 12th as well. Tickets are $18. Um, the evening shows start at 7 p.m. And the December 12th matinee starts at noon. And we are taking COVID-19 precautions this year. Masks are required for entry. And there is limited seating due to social distancing. The tickets can be sold online via email at feastofcarols at yahoo.com. If you request a ticket reservation form, it will be sent to you and a representative will get back to you on the ticket purchase. And we just really look forward to seeing as many people as possible come see our show. Um, it's going to be a really good one. <laughs> Fantastic. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to have a, a short video here of their choir singing one of the, the songs from the, the Feast of Carols. That is showbiz. Let's give him a. <laughs> we have fantastic youth in our community, and it's great to, to share with them and that talent that they have. 
Next item we have is uh, another special event here for the Sholo Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we'll turn this on to Rob Hepner, the acting director here of the chamber, and Trish Spear. Thank you guys for being here. Yeah, and Trisha Spear. So uh, we're excited that we got a great big turnout again for the uh, chamber report. You guys are doing you great. Thought it was you know, a you can't keep coming every month. month. That's <laughs> why you're on that on that plan now. Okay, we see now. Uh, so numbers are pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see on your screens there the Facebook reaches is consistent. Uh, Google is the actual Google page where people, when they search to find a business, uh, they interact and and that's usually how they get it telephone number or things like that, you'll see that that's actually doing pretty well. And another one of note is uh, Pinterest. We've been pulling all the businesses that are Sholo Chamber members as their own little pin. And that's actually helping and growing and getting attention. So that was one of Courtney uh, at, the, uh, at the building there. She's been doing that and uh, doing well with it, as you can see by the numbers. Instagram's pretty straightforward. 500 average per post. Uh, we're still planning for Sholo Days and Derby Down the Deuce. Um, we're still planning for the annual meeting. And we've had some discussions about the chamber breakfast, but, and talks with the hospital and things going around, it will probably be stalling that off a little bit longer because gatherings aren't going to be where we need to be to be able to do that. So um, the in person, once again, yeah, we're looking to refinance the building. We've had one turn down so far in being able to do that. So we're looking at another bank to hopefully try to refinance the building to, to reduce the cost of that payment and make it a little more stable for us uh, moving forward. Um, we'll f get feedback as we get that. We had a meeting today with the uh, Arizona Office of Tourism, the Visitor Information Center, uh, that actually went really well. Um, we had some concerns about things we could do in the building in hours. Uh, you'll note it we, we uh, actually have our hours from nine to four Monday through Friday. And um, that's specific because it's eight hours a day, which ends up being 40 hours. With a single individual at 41 hours, you get into the over, overtime. So it'd be easier for us just to deal with that. Saturdays were off um, during the winter months. So that, that takes that up. Um, we'll, if we can work with that, we're clear. And they're okay with that hours wise. They're okay with what we have inside the building. And uh, we're going to be asking probably the mayor and the um, city manager for a letter short to give to Arizona Office of Tourism to ask for the office to be officially in place at our building. And then we'll be recognized on the website, the app, and get all the other benefits of that. And uh, everything today, Tricia was on the call and Angie was as well. It seems like that's going to be no problem. So we'll be, like I said, we'll be asking for that. And like I said, we're closed on Saturdays. You look at those TIC numbers, uh, 269. It, I've been in the chamber on the board for five years, and the average number each month was like 100 and something. So we are consistently staying in that. That's almost 300 in October. Traffic has slowed down a little bit. We were in the 400s the last three months. Um, this is actually good, good feedback, and I think that goes a lot along with the people getting their telephone calls answered when they call in and having somebody that's friendly and nice in there every single day when they walk through the door. So uh, any questions? Oh, one, one note, we are going to be decorating for Christmas. Don't worry about that. <laughs> any comments, questions? Council Member Leach? Is your Saturdays for winter? Yes. Only? Winter yeah, only. that's only winter. And that's always, we've always done that, like in the right, right around uh, um, Halloween. The off. winter's not here yet, just so you know. Well, <laughs> I know <laughs> winter out, so okay. off off, so off season. Bad. We'll just call it off season. Okay. Any the comments, questions of council? Thank you for your report. We appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item we have is the consent calendar. Is there any items on the consent calendar that need to be pulled or discussed? Here, I'd like to pull uh, seven A, please. Seven A, and discuss it more, or pull it. You just want to, just to for discuss, it, discuss it. Discuss okay. it. Yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and uh, look for a motion to approve uh, the other item we have is consideration acceptance of amendment of the governor's office highway grant consideration to approve and hire an additional full time equivalent and consideration of the minutes of November third, twenty twenty. Need a motion. I move. You have a motion. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Hatch. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Yeah, pass. Brant, you there? I vote aye, your mayor. Okay, thank you. Good to see you that pass seven to zero. Next item, and then we'll go back to item seven A on the consent calendar: consideration of acceptance of the senior center kitchen expansion 
Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I just want to thank uh, staff and, and uh, everybody who got that grant together for the Meals and Wheels Senior Center to uh, enlarge that kitchen. It was a great addition to that. If anybody's ever been up there and seen it, it, it they increased it about 400 square feet. So we had uh, three or four more new freezers in there, some refrigerators, and a lot more storage room for food too for the for the seniors and for Meals and Wheels. So thank you very much for your uh, completion of that, and and thank you for uh, getting that pushed along as fast as you did. Thank you. Anything else on that? I'll look for a motion to provide item seven A of the consent calendar. Uh -huh. We have a motion by uh, Council Member Leach, seconded by Council Vice Mayor. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Yeah, pass seven to zero. Thank you. Next item we have is item eight <clears throat> A public hearing consideration of appeal of conditional use permit six zero two zero four two three two submitted by Young Design Group on behalf of Verizon Wireless. I just want to make a note here that for this public hearing, uh, due to COVID-19, we're allowing citizens to call in to participate in the November 17th public hearing. If you'd like to speak during the public hearing regarding the appeal on the conditional use permit, you may call in at 928-207-8109 during the public hearing portion. Leave your name and number, and staff will return that call. We ask for those people who call in that this applies, that you live in the city of Sholo, and that this pertains to that item only, okay? And so at this time, I'll turn the time to Justin Tregaskis here. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. I do have a staff report that I will be presenting. Uh, additionally, there are a few slides that I'll be going through. Uh, the purpose essentially is to uh, review background information, uh, perhaps answer some questions up front, uh, following my presentation, myself as well as the applicant will be available for questions. We can do I just interject here a little bit, now if I can, before you start? I just want the public to know that as we go through this, uh, things that are mentioned in this slide are already talked about or brought up. Uh, please make note of that if that's something that you wanted to talk about, because if it's already been discussed or addressed, uh, we want to limit the new items or new discussion or new topics that, that may be different than what we've already seen or heard. So kind of watch and listen as we go through here so that we don't repeat ourselves uh, redundantly because we've had a lot of time to review this as, as staff has as well as council. And so we've asked them to prepare this to kind of give a thorough overview and understanding of, of where we're at tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as a reminder, this has been scheduled for a public hearing. Uh, following the public hearing, the council will have three options, uh, essentially to uphold the commission decision as is. Uh, you can uphold the commission decision and modify the uh, conditions of approval, or you can overturn the commission decision and deny the conditional use permit. If you choose to deny the conditional use permit, any motion must state the reasons for doing so. That's based on city code as well as uh, FCC federal law requirements. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and start the staff report. On September 22nd of 2020, the Planning and Zoning Commission met to discuss conditional use permit 6020432 submitted by Young Design Group on behalf of Verizon Wireless to allow for a 110 foot monopine cell tower Located at 591 North Park Road, 3980 West Cooley, that being AP number 309-52027B. Six commission members were present. Commissioner Bess was absent. During this meeting, two motions to approve were made. Neither motion received a majority vote. No motion to deny was ever made by the commission. In accordance with local, state, and federal requirements, any motion to deny must state the reasons for doing so. Following approximately two hours of discussion and public input, the commission voted to continue this item to the October 13th meeting to allow for a full commission to be present. At its regular meeting of October 13th, the commission heard additional information presented by staff and the applicant, as well as additional public input from concerned area property owners. According to the site plan, the existing trees in the vicinity of the proposed tower are approximately 60, 62, 68, 72, and 73 feet tall. 
The applicant is proposing a 110 foot tall monopine tower, which would be approximately 40 feet taller than the surrounding trees. The applicant has provided a picture of an actual installation of one of their monopine towers. Uh, this was attached with the council's packet for review. For reference, the two most recently approved towers in the city were 80 feet tall. City Code Section 15169 G2D1 states, quote, Towers must be set back a distance equal to 125% of the height of the tower from any adjoining lot line, but may be reduced by the commission if the goals of this ordinance would be better served thereby. Based on this requirement, the setback for a 110-foot tower would be 137.5 feet from all property lines. The applicant has proposed the following setbacks. 93.8 feet to the north, 200.8 feet to the east, 158 feet to the south, and 124.7 feet to the west. Due to the dimensions of the property, it is impossible to place the tower outside of the 200-foot visual corridor protection area and meet the 137.5-foot setback from all property lines. Also, City Code Section 15169 G2E1 states, quote, Separation from all residentially zoned property shall be a minimum of 200 feet, but may be reduced by the Commission if the goals of this ordinance would be better served thereby. End quote. To meet the 200 foot roadway visual corridor protection area, the tower will only be set back 124.7 feet from the residentially zoned properties to the west of the subject property. Per city code, the Commission may grant an allowance. To reduce the fall zone and separation from residentially zoned property requirements provided, quote, the goals of this ordinance would be better served thereby. Per City Code, Section 15169A, the goals of the ordinance are to, one, protect residential areas and land uses from potential adverse impacts of towers and antennas, two, encourage the location of towers in non-residential areas, three, minimize the total number of towers throughout the community, Four, strongly encourage the joint use of new and existing tower sites as a primary option rather than construction of additional single-use towers. Five, encourage users of towers and antennas to configure them in a way that minimizes the adverse visual impact of the towers and antennas through careful design, siting, landscape screening, and innovative camouflaging techniques. Six, consider the public health and safety of communication towers. Seven, avoid potential damage to adjacent properties from tower failure through engineering and careful solving of tower structures. And eight, protect airport approach corridors. The applicant has not requested a variance, but a reduction to the setbacks from a residential zone and the 125% fall zone setback along the north property line. This request is permitted by city code and is not a variance. Only the Board of Adjustment can approve a variance to city code. The applicant has requested that the Planning and Zoning Commission allow a 75.3 foot reduction to the 200 foot setback from a residential zone, which would be 124.7 feet. The applicant is also requesting a 43.7 foot reduction of the 137.5 foot setback to the north property line, which would be 93.8 feet. Reductions to these setbacks are allowed by code if the commission feels that the goals of the ordinance would be better served by the decision. Property was posted and letters were sent to all property owners within 300 foot of the subject property. I would add that the, those letters were sent to the addresses on file with Navajo County. Prior to the last meeting, staff received a phone call and email from a resident identifying himself as a representative of the Fairway Park Homeowners Association. He expressed concerns of visual aesthetics, health effects, declining property values, due to the proposed tower. An email from this individual has been attached for your review. At the regularly scheduled Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of September 22nd, 2020, several neighboring property owners spoke in opposition to the proposed tower. Also, several neighbors located within 300 foot of the property indicated that they had not received notice of the meeting. Staff, city staff mailed letters to all property owners within 300 feet of the subject property using the mailing addresses obtained from Navajo County tax record. In addition, public notice signs were posted on the subject property off both West Cooley and North Clark Road. City Code Section 15133F regarding notification requirements state, quote, notice of the nature of the conditional use permit application and the date of the meeting at which it will be considered shall be posted on the property 
and shall be mailed to the owners of all real property within 300 feet of the property for which the application was made, at least 10 days prior to the meeting. Notwithstanding the notice requirements set forth in this section, the failure of any person or entity to receive notice shall not constitute grounds for any court to invalidate the action for which the notice was given. This item was originally heard by the Commission at the regular meeting of September 22, 2020. A number of property owners spoke in opposition to the proposed project. Concerns included health issues, impacts to property values, the reduction in the residential setback, clearing of trees, and safety. Residents also questioned the need for this specific site and suggested other locations might be better suited. Two motions to approve the request were made, with both motions failing. No motion was made to deny the application. The Commission then continued this item from the September 22, 2020 meeting to October 13, 2020, in order to allow for a full Commission to be present. Since the September meeting, staff has received multiple emails and letters from nearby property owners in opposition to the proposed Monopine Tower. These letters and emails are attached for your review. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and go through the uh, few slides here for you. Again, uh, in interest of providing background information. Uh, you can see there, that's the timeline. Uh, the application was originally received August 25th of 2020. Uh, we had three meetings, uh, September 22nd, October 13th, uh, at which the item was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, this item was then appealed. The City Council held a meeting October 20th, at which time you directed staff to schedule this for a public hearing, which is why we're here this evening. Uh, at the September 22nd, 2020 meeting, uh, there were two, ma two motions made to approve. Uh, neither received the votes necessary to pass. There was no motion to deny. I'll point out again that city code and federal law require a motion to deny with reasons stated for doing so for a cell tower. Uh, this was continued to October 13th, uh, and we had uh, quite a bit of public deliberation at that first meeting. October 13th, we had a full commission uh, present. No motion to deny was made. Uh, the motion did pass, or the item did pass, subject to commission uh, recommendations by a vote of four to three. And again, uh, quite a bit of public testimony and input was taken at that meeting. I'll point out applicable code sections. Section 15132 governs conditional use permits. Section 15169 governs wireless telecommunications powers and antennas. Those are the two portions of city code that are relevant to this discussion. Section 15131, which is entitled Text Amendment and Zone Changes, does not apply as this is not a zone change. Also, Section 15135, Appeals and Variances, does not apply as this is not a variance. Variances are only heard by the Board of Adjustment, not the Planning and Zoning Commission or the City Council. Uh, as stated in City Code, uh, we have what we call uh, informally the fall zone. Uh, essentially, that's if the tower were to fail at the base and uh, fall like a tree, um, that would be the fall zone. City code requires 125% of the height uh, for a fall zone. However, section 15159G2D states, towers must be set back a distance equal to at least 125% of the height of the tower from any adjoining lot line but may be reduced by the commission if the goals of this ordinance would be better served thereby. Uh, you'll notice the bold and underline, uh, that's emphasis that I added there. Uh, reduction by the commission is permitted by code and is not a variance and it's not a violation of city code. Uh, the same thing as far as setbacks from residentially zoned properties. Uh, code reads separation from all residentially zoned properties shall be a minimum of 200 feet again, but may be reduced by the commission if the goals of this ordinance would be better served thereby. Uh, again, reduction by the commission is permitted by code and is not a variance or a violation of city code. <clears throat> the goals of the ordinance are spelled out in section 15169A. Uh, those are listed below. First is to protect residential areas and land uses from potentially adverse impacts of towers and antennas. I would point out that this is commercially zoned property. 
Uh, there's commercial property on the north, there's commercial property on the south, there's commercial property to the east. The property to the west is zoned uh, residential. It previously was zoned commercial, uh, but went through a zone change in 2007 to allow for those lots to be developed as residential lots. Uh, the uh, lot owned by Ms. Cash uh, is one of those lots that went through that zone change. Um, Goal number two, encourage the location of towers in non-residential areas. Again, this is commercially zoned property. Uh, minimize the total number of towers throughout the community. The applicant has indicated that this tower will be designed in such a way that additional uh, locators could be on the tower, uh, thereby reducing the potential number of towers in the future. Strongly encourage the joint use of new and existing tower sites as a primary option rather than construction of additional single-use towers. Again, this is being designed as a multi-use tower. Uh, goals continued, encourage users of towers and antennas to configure them in a way that minimizes the adverse visual impact of towers and antennas through careful design, siding, landscape screening, and innovative camouflaging <coughs> techniques. Uh, the applicant has indicated that this will be a monopine type tower. Uh, and there are other pine trees in the area that this would be uh, located nearby or around. Uh, this tower is proposed to be 110 feet tall. The adjacent pine trees are approximately tallest about 70 feet tall. Uh, but rather than go with a lattice type tower uh, or a pole type tower, they are proposing a monopine. Consider the public health and safety of communication towers. Uh, the base of the tower, the footprint, will be fenced uh, to prohibit the uh, trespass of people there by the tower. Also, they have indicated that they will not exceed the FCC health uh, regulations as far as emissions from the tower. And finally, protect airport approach corridors. Uh, they have filed an FAA Form 7460. Uh, that is uh, Primarily the form that the Federal Aviation Administration looks at to determine whether the location of a tower is a hazard to air navigation. The FAA came back with a determination of no hazard, uh, and this tower is not proposed to be lit. Uh, October 20th, City Council meeting. Again, uh, quite a bit of public testimony and deliberation, and uh, you guys voted to schedule this for a public hearing for this evening. Concerns that were brought forth, uh, potential health effects, impacts on property values, safety issues, uh, other possible locations, reduction of setbacks, and aesthetics. Uh, brief recap of options for tonight. This is a, a public hearing. Council may, after the public hearing, determine to uphold the commission decision with no changes to the conditions of approval. Uphold the commission decision and modify the conditions of approval. Overturn the commission decision and deny the conditional use permit. Any motion to deny must state the reasons for doing so. And the council's decision shall be final and shall be effective immediately. Uh, as a review, the commission decision were these five items. Number one, all development shall comply with all applicable federal, state, and local requirements including FCC or Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA and building permit requirement. Number two, the antenna and supporting structure shall not exceed 110 feet. No addition to the height of the tower shall be permitted. Number three, the tower shall be in substantial conformance with the submitted site plan and submitted determination of no hazard to air navigation. Number four, a maintenance plan for the tower shall be submitted to the Planning and Zoning Department. <clears throat> the tower shall be maintained in accordance with this plan. And finally, as indicated by the applicant, no generator shall be utilized. With that, uh, staff is available for questions. The applicant is also present uh, and is available for questions or to prevent or to uh, <clears throat> add additional information. Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate that summary. This time, is there any questions at this point? Uh, <coughs> that's a woman, Kakavis. Thank you. That was a lot of reading. I apologize. Justin, 
you talked about the original zoning was commercial and then it was rezoned to C2, is that correct, to allow for the residential in the back? Um, let me zoom in here on subject property map. Um, so you can see on the map in front of you, uh, the subject property has the 3980 right in the middle of it. That property is zoned C2. That is the original zoning for this property. It dates back to 1976 or so, whenever zoning became effective in the city of Sholo. Properties directly to the west, which are labeled as 561, 541, 521, and 501, those also were originally zoned commercial. They were originally zoned C2. At the request of the property owner in 2007, those four properties were rezoned from commercial to residential. Uh, so that's why you see that yellow line cutting in between the two. Uh, that's to designate the boundary between the residential and the commercial. But originally, those four properties were commercially zoned property. Explain what 3920 is that jog out. <laughs> 3920 is an entirely separate piece of property and is not part of. Uh, the consideration this evening. Um, it, uh, it's an interesting piece of property. We envision at some point it will probably be combined with 3980 in order to uh, promote development between the two properties. But at this point, it's a separate individual piece of property. Uh, it is also zoned commercial. Any other questions? The other little triangle. Or not triangle. Uh, the little rectangle there in the center. To extend the conference for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. press 1. <laughs> we may be extending it more than just 15 minutes, I think. Um, again, that's just a, uh, we're not sure what that parcel represents. Um, it just shows up on the parcel maps. So. Is it a separate parcel? It doesn't show up as a separate parcel number or anything like that. Um, again, it's, I think it's just a holdover from back in the day, as far as that goes. Uh, Council Member Leach. Justin, can you show us with your pointer exactly where this tower is? It's not on this map, right? I mean, we walk, I walked out there and where's it actually gonna be located with your? So this is a city aerial. This is not provided by the applicant. Uh, the area for the proposed tower is approximately where this C2 is shown on the map. So kind of that northwest corner, but inset uh, from the residential and inset from the commercial line to the, to the north. Councilwoman Kukavis. Leasing this property, and are they leasing the entire 3980? Uh, it's our understanding that they are leasing the portion of the property that the tower and the related equipment will be on. Uh, which is just about a 20 by 30 footprint. Uh, the remainder of the property would be just under the existing ownership. So there could be other development? Yes. Sir. I, I, real That's quick, I, I guess just to clarify, I know a lot of us were on planning and zoning, so C2. I mean, we could put a motel there. We could put, there's just a lot of things that could go there that I don't know would make it look any better, especially for the people that have homes back there on on the 561 or 501. But in all reality, we can put a 40 story motel there if it, because of the C2, correct? So the property is zoned C2. Uh, there are a number of permitted and conditional uses that are associated with that. Uh, maximum building height um, is on commercially on C2 zone property is 45 feet. Uh, you would need to match whatever the, the height of the building. You would need to be that far away from the property line. So as an example, if they were to put in a 45 foot tall uh, hotel on that property, it would need to be 45 feet from the property line. That doesn't preclude things like parking lots, loading zones, uh, trash dumpsters, things like that. Uh, those could be located between the building and the property line. Uh, as far as uses go on that property, I mean, if you drive up and down the Deuce of Clubs, that's primarily C2 property. 
uh, any of those types of uses could uh, be put onto this property. Council Member Kelly. Now that prompts a question to me. If the tower is allowed, how does that prohibit any of the other development or does it? It would not prohibit any of the other development. Obviously, they would need to take that into account as they develop the site. So potentially you could have the tower plus a building on this property. Hotel. Potentially, or any of the other uses, yes. I guess my question, if we were to approve this and reduce the fall uh, zone or the fall distance, would that apply to somebody building a new building on C2? They would be able to be closer to that tower than the code, or would they have to come for a conditional permit to be able to have the same reduction from that? Structure. The, the fall zones are measured to property lines. Um, in this case, the, the property is remaining intact. The tower uh, is leasing just a portion of that property. So the tower and the future potential building, we would not require that they be meet the fall zone between themselves. We would not require that the tower and the building meet that same fall zone that we're requiring for the property lines to the north and to the west. So in the future then somebody could build a, a building right next to that tower within 10 feet. A fairly close, yes. Okay. Any other questions at this time? Councilwoman Kakavas. Is that the only portion of the property that's available to the applicant? There are other portions of the property that are available. Um, as we discussed with the commission, the major limiting factor on this property is there is a 200-foot visual corridor buffer along any of our major roadways. Um, that is not one of those buffers that's allowed to be adjusted by the commission. Uh, the fall zone and the separation to residential, we have the wording in that says may be reduced by the commission. The 200-foot visual corridor does not have that same wording. Um, the commission does not have the ability to reduce that. When you look at the site plan, um, in fact, let me just kind of skip to it a little bit here. Um, this shows it a little bit. You can see the property line along what would be the northeast side of the property running along Clark Road. This line right here is the line that parallels that property line at 200 feet. They're proposing to be set back 200.7 feet from the roadway. So they have pushed that as close to the roadway as they can um, and still meet the 200 foot. As you move to the south, that 200 foot um, gets you a little bit further away from these residentials, but now you're getting into the setback from Cooley Road. So um, it, it's really, it, it's not possible to move this site on the property and meet the three setbacks without a reduction that was made by the commission. Vice Mayor. Justin, I guess I have a question then. If, um, if you went through 15.1.59, you have your setbacks. We have we have setbacks already set in place, and commission is one to go ahead and change those setbacks. If I'm hearing everything right, to fit the tower in. So far, am I correct, or am I blowing smoke? So the the applicant requested the reduction in setbacks. The commission allowed that reduction based on the section of code. Yes. And then you, then according to you, according to our code, it's legal for us to change the setback. Is that correct? The code allows for the commission to reduce the fall zone setback and the setback to residentially zoned property, which they did in this case. And then and that just, but if, if the commission didn't do that, then the dang thing couldn't fit in there then. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. 
And if we try to change those, if we try to change them back, then we're changing what the commission did, which is that, that it goes against them. But so theoretically, what we have in our code, we change it to modify to make this thing where, where it would try to fit on there. That is correct. If the council feels that the reduction in setbacks made by the commission uh, was not appropriate, and that those setbacks should remain as uh, written in code with no reduction, then the council would need to overturn the commission decision and deny the conditional use permit uh, and state the reasons why you are doing so. Thank you. Are they maximizing the reduction 100% of what they're allowed to do or, or just a portion? So the, the reduction, I mean, you saw in the presentation, there is no limit as to how much the commission can reduce those. Technically, the commission, if they felt the need, could reduce them to zero foot. Uh, in this case, the applicant came and said, look, we've pushed it as far towards the road as we can. Um, we're asking for reduction to the north and we're asking for a reduction to the west. And the commission did grant those uh, that request. Can you share with us what, how many feet they're reducing that to the north and to the west? Um, yeah, I had it in my staff oh, artwork. Um, so to the north, they're supposed to be, I think, 137, and they are at 93.8, so that's 43 feet, give or take. To the west, they're supposed to be 200. Um, unless, and, and when I say supposed to be, that's the established by code, right. but it can be reduced. Um, the initial number established by code is 200. They're at 124.7, so 75.3. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Councilwoman Kakavas. On the north property line, that, that is commercial property connecting with this property. Correct. Um, I'll back up to the aerial that shows the area. The property to the north is uh, the Dollar General property. Um, I'll go back a little bit more. I've got a lot of slides here, so you're going <laughs> to see me doing this a fair bit tonight. Um, so the property to the north, you can see the red line that divides uh, the subject property to uh, 650 North Clark Road. That is the property line between the two. So the 93 feet takes you to the property line. Uh, then you've got parking lot, and then you've got building. So when you're looking at the fall zone, it takes quite a bit before it will actually land on the structure to the north. Um, it... Uh, it would land into the parking lot area first if it were to fa fail within its entirety. We have received documentation from the applicant regarding their engineering uh, that this is not designed to fail at the base, that it's designed to fail at the midpoint, uh, which would result, if that were to happen, uh, in about a 55-foot fall rather than a 110-foot fall. So. Um, that that is some information that we've received. Justin, there's a large power line on the back of this property. Can you point that out for us? Where, where that... Um, so the power line essentially runs. You can see a shadow right here. That's the power pole. You can see a shadow right here. That's the power pole. Um, so the power line connects there. Um, I believe there's also a power pole here. Uh, you can see a shadow. Um, so again, and then it runs to the north at that point. So along the property line, it appears to be is where it runs, which is again 120 feet or so from the proposed tower location. They're proposing to cut down any trees on that site. They are not proposing to cut down any trees. Um, the site plan indicates that no trees will be removed. Um, they have located this in a, in a location where no trees are required to be taken out in order to allow for the installation. Uh, you'll also notice that one of the uh, commission decision is that they have substantial compliance with the submitted site plan. The site plan indicates that no trees would be removed. Sub substantial conformance would mean you're not taking out any trees with this. You know, I'm not sure if this question could be for you or for the applicant, but 
the tower is 110. If they're going to use the uh, camouflage for the make it a look like a tree, is that going to stick above the 110 foot level? So the maximum height from ground to the very top is 110 feet. <coughs> um, so the, the the pine tree will not go any higher than 110 feet. The antenna itself at the center line is actually 95 feet. Uh, and then a portion of the antenna extends up to 100 feet. Then they add an additional 10 foot of topper uh, at, at the top of that, just to kind of give it a little bit more shape um, so that you're not squaring it off. So maximum height of this would be 110 feet, including all pine tree camouflage uh, type accessories. Council Member Leach. I guess now that he brought that up, the quick comment I got is I've, you know, I've seen these all over the place, Flagstaff, obviously Scottsdale's got a bunch of them. The part that really bothers me as far as the way it looks is the fence. I mean, you see these everywhere, and I would never recognize these towers anywhere. I mean, I was sitting at a restaurant in Flagstaff, and I seen this guy climbing a tree. Well, it was one of those towers, and so I looked more, and, and what gave it away was the was the fencing around it. If anything looks ugly around these, is the fencing because, and I know they have to have it, but if there was any way to camouflage that fencing where it kind of blended in, would make more sense to me because I don't think anybody could drive into this town, even if it's, I don't know how many feet above the trees that are out there. Um, I, I'm not sure because you go out in the forest and there would be one tree all by itself that's taller than any other one. So that one doesn't really bother me as much as the fencing. I think if that fencing around it somehow was camouflaged into that, people come in this community and probably would never know. To extend notice. the conference for 15 minutes, press 1. Nobody would ever notice that that was a tower to me. And once you look at it more and you get up closer, yeah, maybe. But if you're driving by, I think the, the part to me that looks ugly is the fencing. And I know wrought iron fencing, it's a beautiful fencing, but it highlights the tower to me. So. Uh, that's kind of the only way that I know it's a tower, and as far as the, the looks of it, I, 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 I don't know. They look fine to me. I just don't like that. <laughs> Thank you. Vice Mayor. Justin, did they give you a um, life expectancy of what, how long this stuff will last before they have to change it out? They did not, no. Uh, one of the requirements uh, as passed by the commission is that they give us a maintenance plan. Um, we haven't received that yet because we don't have final approval that this is actually going through. Thank you. Um, so they would have to give us that as part of this process. This time I'm going to ask the applicant if they would come up and just share uh, any information. I know at our last meeting when we talked about uh, other locations, possibly if you could weigh in a little bit on the other proposed uh, locations that were shared by the neighborhood as well as why you need this uh, tower. And, and I really want to hear from you your opinion as to how many people in the community that you think that this tower will benefit uh, as a whole, not just as, you know, it, you don't have to be exact, I'm not going to take a poll, but, but is it only going to benefit a fraction of our, our community or share with us what, what the potential you know, good is to the community for this, okay? Thank, Thank you, Mayor. Um, I spoke with the Fire Chief Savage today um, and um, Roy Maloney, who used to be on the Fire Department here, and they both gave me quite a few talking points as to why and how this is going to help the community. Um, Chief Savage said that the data capacity right now, which is the true issue for this site, is is um, affecting their ability to service the community in a, as a whole. Uh, he said every weekend the systems are getting overloaded. Call volumes average 6,200 calls a month. Full-time residents in the area are 35,000. When you get your seasonal visitors, you add 15 to 20,000 and sometimes more for that number of users. Calls have been bumped to the county, to Navajo County, before reaching them. 
which he feels is a safety issue for everyone in general. Um, hold on. Uh, they said the 911 system is extremely dependent on making sure the calls for emergency service get routed to the appropriate 911 dispatch center. Having 911 callers get transferred between dispatch centers delays responses and could lead to a case of death. All of our fire and rescue apparatuses are equipped with computers um, that use the mobile data that are linked to the 911 dispatch center called the computer aided dispatching where emergency incidents are received and set out from. These computers are dependent on the system that um, Verizon Wireless actually uses for their data. Uh, and they are, they are actually on the Verizon Wireless system, they confirmed. Um, says the uh, dispatch system is who the emergency responders receive their vital incident and patient information from, how they receive their mapping to go to the uh, location of the incident, and when the c cellular system does not operate correctly, our mapping system goes down, thus having to rely on paper maps that are hard to keep up to date and dangerous to read while operating the vehicles. Um, it says all of our computers and their cardiac heart monitors operate off of the uh, cellular signals that require a strong cell signal and data capacity to receive and transmit data. The data from their heart monitors needs to be transmitted and received by the hospital for medical direction and oversight and instant interaction between the doctors and field medics. So that's the information they gave us on how this helps the community as a whole. Um, it's not just going to help this small little area. It actually um, offloads the other two towers, which are at capacity at this point. He can tell you more about that part. <laughs> that's what he is here for. Um, so you gave them the justification, right? Did you get this one? No. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Justin, you might have some of the slides he's looking for, right? No. Mm -mm. No, these are new ones? These are, since our last meeting, we so, did an awful lot of research. Okay. Um, is there a way we can you, try yeah. it? Okay. So um, your question was how, what part of the community is going to affect? It's going to affect the area where uh, the site's going. I don't know the exact amount of houses, but probably within a, a, a mile in diameter. There we go. There's an RF. There's one more called RF justification. And bring. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Um, just an overview, it's 110 foot monopine, pretty standard stuff. Verizon's at 95 foot center line, so that's the center of the antenna. The antenna is going to be about eight foot tall, so the antenna's tip will be at 99 foot below the top of the tower. Uh, wireless utilization, just a fun facts 82% of all mobile data traffic will be video traffic by 2021. Video is very, 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 uh, takes a lot of horsepower to get video through a wireless network, and it's a lot of capacity. 57% of homes rely exclusively on cell phones, and 80% calls for 911 are placed on wireless devices. The 57% is going to be up, or the utilization's up because of COVID. A lot of people working from home. Everybody understands that. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, the objective of the new site is capacity. Um, so, a uh, simple way to look at capacity. Capacity is the amount of calls or the amount of traffic handled by a site. You have two sites. In Sholo, you have the, the site on the east and the site on the northwest. Those sites have been provided capacity and coverage. Call that the Thanksgiving principle. If you have a capacity, so let's say you're at home with your significant other, you're, you have a Wi-Fi access point. 
you're having Wi-Fi service at home, you have coverage in certain rooms, you have capacity, you can go to a certain room and, and stream Netflix, you can surf the web, you can do emails. Pretty standard with two people. It's a, it's a radio channel, finite resource. There's two people talking on that radio channel, using that channel. Now the Thanksgiving show, everybody shows up for Thanksgiving dinner. What's the first thing everybody asks? Hey, what's your Wi-Fi password? Standard stuff. Everybody climbs on. Now there's not two users. There's 10 users, 20 users. There can be multiple streaming video runs. There can be all sorts of things happening. All of a sudden, maybe in this room, you don't get quite as good a coverage you used to get. Signal bars went down. Maybe you start to slow down. You can't stream the site. It starts buffering. That's where we get into a capacity environment. A radio channel is like a, it's like a water hose. If one person is drinking from the water hose, they have 100% of the capacity. If two people drink from the water hose, they both have 50%. If four people drink from the same hose, they all have 25%. It goes down. Water hose is going to send a certain amount of gallons per minute, just like a radio channel is going to have a certain amount of bandwidth. All the users share that bandwidth, so they're all drinking from the same water hose. So the objective is to offload the capacity from AZ3 Deuce Clubs, which is the site on the east side of town. And then uh, it's really basically just two sectors. It's the alpha sector, the sector facing a little bit north, and then the, the gamma sector facing west. Those are both. That site's over, overloaded. It's overwhelmed. There's a lot of people using it, and it's, it's, uh, it's busy. It's very busy. The second thing it's going to provide is coverage. Typically, capacity is pretty much all we're looking for is just to try to, try to help offload that site, that AZ3 Deuce Clubs, clubs on the east side. The second part of it, the, the nice part, is you're going to get some additional coverage. Now that you have a transmitter that's closer to the people, closer to where the, all the users are within this general area, now they're going to be able to have coverage inside their house where they didn't get to have coverage inside their house before. Just like with your Wi-Fi at your home, you have coverage good in one room and you don't have good in another room. Now you're going to have good coverage in the other room. So if we imagine the area this site's going to serve, let's say it's like this room in here. Okay, We're all standing in the room. We're all taking capacity. The fire marshal has a limit on how much people can be in this room. That's the capacity of the room. Same thing with the radio channel on the site. It has a capacity. Right? This is all it can do. It can't do anymore. The site to the east is out of capacity. It's trying to cover this room and all the other rooms surrounding it. It's not, it's not able to handle that. It needs somebody to come in and offload. So the best thing to do is when you have a site that's got coverage and a capacity issue and you have another site that's covering down, you want to put a site in the middle that's on the cell edge. Split the coverage up, split the capacity up from the site that's hurting and the other site. And then you have more coverage, you have more in-building service, you have more capacity, so you've got better throughput, you don't buffer on the Netflix, you don't, you know, your emails come in on time when you surf the web, it doesn't get really, really, really slow. Those are the things that impact capacity within this area. So look at it like it's just a bunch of rooms, a bunch of areas that have to be covered, and there's a limited resource to use that. So we'll get coverage on Linden Road, Hawthorne Road, surrounding suburban areas. Also help a lot on Highway 260. Okay, so if we look at the 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 area, the on-air site. This is the show show high site up on the northwest side of town. We have the Deuce of Club site down on the east side of town. Part AZ3 Parsons proposed site is a split between this site and this site, but the capacity issue is this site. So we want to offload this guy by getting all of the customers that are in this area instead of being served by this guy, to be served by this guy. But we also want to bridge the coverage over to Show High and help offload him as well. The primary concern is AC3 Deuce of Clubs. Now, wait, slow down a minute. Um, I have a quick question, if you don't mind, Mayor. You, you keep going sites, this one to this one, but in reality, how, how far are you talking as far as coverage? Is, uh, for the, for I know you're pointing to this one goes to this one, that one goes to that one, but what are you talking about distance-wise? How, how much coverage? So if you, look, if you look at AZ3 Parsons, it's probably going to cover three-quarters of a mile to a mile in, in diameter around that site. It's going to be able to provide assistance to people to the southwest a mile away, to the east a mile away. So you're getting more coverage in this area around the, a lot of the, the um, golf courses and the, the area, the houses around this area. But it's also providing where we get a little bit of in-building problems up in this area uh, to the east of where the proposed site is, it's going to help with coverage in that area as well. So if you draw a diameter circle, and I'll show you on some plots here in a, in a moment what that means, 
Um, if you look at it like, uh, so there's some alternative sites that I'm going to review. Uh, Councilman Hatch was very specific in what he wanted to see and understand. Um, think of, go back to the room scenario. We're all in the room. Okay, let's say it's a cocktail party. We're all having a good time. We're sitting, we're chatting. Mr. Mayor, you're on the east side of town and you're about a block over and you're trying to talk to everybody within this area, right? So you're farther away. You're having to raise your voice so you can be heard and you're sharing information with people in this room, but you're two blocks away. Same thing with uh, AZ, AZ3 Show High. Uh, Councilman Hatch is on the northwest side of town and he's two or three blocks away from this room. And you both are talking very loudly try to talk to the people in this room. Well, you have to talk really loud, and the people talking back to you have to talk really loud, and there's a lot of people in this room in this area being served by you and the councilman. So what we do is we try to bring another person to talk or another announcer. Instead of placing another announcer two-tenths of a mile from you, Mr. Mayor, or two-tenths of a mile from you, Councilman Hatch, we try to put another person talking in the middle of where the people are. And that's what's going on with this proposed site. We're trying to, we're trying to add coverage and capacity in the area that's needed, in the area that's serving the people. Putting a site around on the outside and adding another person standing far away from the area and talking and trying to talk to the people in this room, it's just going to be another loudspeaker. It's going to be another person. Everybody's going to have to change their voice and get real loud and talk. Best way to to say that is if I'm talking to my compatriot here, we're next to each other. We, see, we hear each other really well. We communicate. We understand what each other is saying. But if she's a block away, standing by Councilman Hatch, she has to talk really loud. I'm not going to be able to hear her as well. So we try to get the site where customers are. All right. I had a question, Mayor. We're at this site here that you're looking at doing, I think the the radius of you picking up cell sites. extend the conference for 15 minutes. <laughs> you still there, Brent? You better be. <laughs> yes, I'm here, Mayor. Thank we're, you. We're just making sure that you're you within better. our distance here. We're talking distances now, so <laughs> I want to make sure you're paying attention. So the, the radius around the site that you're trying to put in, the frequencies that you're sending out and receiving, can you tell me the people that live right next to that five, that 501, 521, 541, 61, is their reception and, uh, and uh, stuff for their um, high-speed internet or uh, any of that stuff, is that going to be any better than what it is right now, or is it going to be better in your bands outside? So it's going to be better in building inside within uh, probably a mile and a half. It's going to be better inside houses because there's going to be additional low band power that penetrates through walls better. And then the capacity wise, it's going to be in the mid band, it's going to be a lot more uh, bandwidth, a lot more people can talk at the same time, utilize the data services in a smaller area. So closer to the tower is going to be better service for them. Yeah, closer because to the, of tower, the radio, Because yeah. of the stuff going through the walls and everything else. Yeah, the energy. The further out, then you get the lower bandwidth you're going to get going out. Yes, sir. It's, it's just like your access point in your house when you're Wi-Fi and you, you have your access point on one side of the house and you walk to the other side of the house, you'll know the signal bar on your laptop or on your phone lowers. Same concept. As you get farther away, the ability to utilize the bandwidth gets worse because you get more noise. Okay, thank you. The system is, there's two other sites it's providing, so it makes a bridge. All right, uh, so here's the two sites, the sectors uh, that are being offloaded uh, from DUSA clubs, and then uh, this is the site to the north, show high site. So I give you three, three types of analysis on coverage analysis. One is, or two are generated by a propagation modeling. So that's a modeling tool that says, I'm going to put an antenna at a certain height, I'm gonna put a frequency on it, and then I'm going to uh, turn it on and propagate it, and it's going to take into account trees, uh, buildings, all sorts of things to show what the coverage is going to be like. It's going to take topography, everything. That's the, that's the RSRP and the best server plots. And the, the open signal maps, uh, whenever you load apps on your phone, sometimes you give permission to load the app and they load other software. And sometimes open signal is loaded on, like you have the Facebook app on your phone or other things. You've given permission for that app to read data from your phone and send it to servers in other areas. That's open signal. That's the crowdsourced data. 
So this is the open signal. So all these little squares are users that have this app loaded. And at, at a particular time, they connected with the wireless network. Green is good. They had a good conversation. They had good quality. Red is they didn't. They didn't have a good conversation. They didn't have good quality. They didn't have good throughput, right? They had uh, you know, lost signals, lost messages, dropped calls. Uh, things buffered, things like that. So as you can see, if you look in the direct area, all the users that are user actually Verizon users that are reporting back to these servers, a lot of red's going on in this area, right? These are people not getting good signal or not getting good capacity. I have another question there. Uh, okay, so another question then would be, if, if these people around here are losing uh, connections or buffering, would it benefit the tower to be lower or higher okay so to um explain lower lower or higher that it's better for the tower to be higher because it has to bridge coverage to the other sites and get these guys out on the edge right so okay. uh, think of it the same way why are you sitting on chairs up above the crowd you have line of sight to the crowd the crowd has line of sight to you the higher the antenna is, the more line of sight the building to see farther. Because I see around here what it is, is if we have a tower up on top of a ridge or a mountain, now we can get it the distance that we need to compared to having it down in the valley where you're restricted to just that valley. Yeah, this is why okay. God put our eyes on our head and not on our knees. Okay. We can see a whole lot better. All right, so this gives you an idea of actual reported subscribers. These people have the, the phones. These are what's going on in the area. Hey, RSRP, it looks like Big Chief and Crayons went crazy. What it is, is this is, I'm going to take the antennas, I'm going to put power on them at a certain frequency, I'm going to propagate them, and they're going to cover a certain amount of area. Green is in building, so with a 95% probability, users within that area, then the green area, they're going to be able to make a phone call or have a, a data session within a building or a house or whatever. If it's yellow, it's in your car. Right? Cars made differently than your house. You've got windows in your car. You're driving around, less loss, right? The, build, the energy can penetrate through the car better than it can the house. Red is open field. I'm outside. I'm outdoors. I'm at the park. I'm on the phone. That's what, that's what red means. So this is what's going on now, right? We have some areas where we don't get coverage. And once again, this is 95% probability. Are there times we're going to get coverage in some of these other areas? Yes. In a low past the environment when there's not many users on three o'clock in the morning, you might get good data connection. It's just how the system works. Now, here's the new site, proposed coverage. We noticed the difference really quick, back and forth. There's that blue circle showing what this is going to impact. Here's the impact of the proposed site. Now, we have a much larger area showing in building coverage. 95% probability is a whole lot bigger area. We've got good bridge from on the, the uh, vehicles going along 260 and into the back roads, as well as we've got, instead of it being no coverage in this area, we have at least open field coverage. We're offloading this site. We're taking customers that used to be served by this guy in this area, this area, all around. Now they're being served by the proposed site. So that's the difference impact. In building coverage, green. In vehicle coverage, yellow. Open field, red. Now, best server. Uh, Councilman Hatch will probably have a little bit more interest in this than anyone else, but basically another it's not another big chief in crayons. This is what's going on with the existing sites. This takes us down to a very low level and says, okay, this guy right here, he's having to serve a really big area. Right? He's doing a lot. He's having to take care. He's got capacity issues. And we can look within this area, the probable site, there's a lot of mix back and forth. There's no dominant server. People are bouncing back and forth between the sites. They're they're talking very loudly. They're creating interference. They're not working as well. Now, if we add the new site in, look what happens. Now we have three new sectors. We're offloading this site. We're fixing the capacity issue with this site. We're helping give the customers that this site can serve a better quality conversation, a better quality data session. We're offloading a little bit this site, and then we're generating a good, dominant, strong server serving the area where the proposed site is. Uh, let's see, so uh, Councilman Hatch asked for a zoom in so he could see really closely what, what was being changed. So I zoomed into the area around uh, the proposed site. This is a lot of the open field coverage, a lot of the in-vehicle, and then some of the indoor. And here's the same area with the new proposed site. So all of these houses, you, Mr. Mayor, you asked, who is this going to impact? 
if you look from here to here, it's pretty significant. There's going to be impact to the positive for a lot of houses and a lot of businesses within this area. They're only going to have in-building coverage where they used to not have in-building coverage. Plus, there'll be some impact to where you're offloading or downtown and places as well, right? Yes, sir, because AC3 Deuce Club is, is out of gas. So once again, the zoom in for Councilman Hatch. Uh, this is the best server in the current area. So you can see the blue, the light blue, the dark blue, the red, uh, the kind of tan color. Um, it's all over the it's all over the board. There, there, it's no real good dominant server. And you come in with the new site, and it really splits up everything. So hopefully that is a good explanation. Shows you what I was talking about. That's been um, This is the the site. Uh, so what? Um, this was the justification package. This is a reasoning why. And once again, the reason for this site is capacity. ACs three Deuce of clubs, and you know by the amount of people that have moved into the area, and by uh, what my compatriot said from the fire chief, it's busy. You, you've got a lot more utilization going on in the market. Now we can go back and uh, look at. Um, so looking at alternate candidates brought up by opposition. I made uh, Nancy help me with uh, getting these plotted. So all of the sites in red were sites that were brought up by opposition. This is a zoom out, and I'll zoom in closer uh, to give you a better picture. So a way to look at it is this right here is the AZ3. Blue is the existing sites. <coughs> Dark blue is existing sites. Green is the proposed site. Any site in red is sites what were brought up by opposition. It's safe to say that if a site is outside of where the AZ3 show high is or west of that site, that site probably is not going to provide any service or any help fix this area. So I didn't really study those sites because I know there's AZ3 Highway 260, uh, which is, I think, uh, south of Clay Springs that provides service in this area in towards Sholo area, and it doesn't do anything in Sholo. So taking that into account, I didn't look at sites to the west of the AZ3 show high site. Uh, those, those aren't going to provide any level of service or help within this area. Now I'm going to zoom mid. This is a, a little closer zoom showing uh, show low at uh, more detail. So here's some of those sites to the west. Once again, anything west of show high, uh, I don't think it's going to provide any service, any help to what's going on in this area. And then there was uh, two sites or the three sites that I or four sites that I looked at. Excuse me, the light blues. Uh, there was a couple of extra sites um, brought up by opposition. One of which was already previously considered. And, uh, Nancy can talk to that better. So when we talked about previously, where Mr. Mayor and you and Councilman Hatch were two blocks away, you were east and he was northwest, and this area of service that you were trying to serve was in this room. You're having to yell pretty pretty loud. Well, now we take and add Councilman Leach over here at this commercial 1.7 acres, and he's having to yell as loud to talk to this area as well. It's a simple way to look at. I'm sorry, but that's, that's what I could come up with. It's not really going to help cover this area and offload the users within this area. Um, so if I look at, at residential cul-de-sac lot, Bison Park, and I look at uh, the 1.7 acres commercial and the previous site that was considered but didn't get, uh, wasn't able to get worked on. These sites, while they're going to offload DUSA clubs, they're not going to help fix the area where all of the capacity is. They're not going to fix all those users I showed you from that open signal map that had red, right? So those sites aren't viable. Um, I have uh, additional detail that I can share. Um, that Councilman Hatch had asked for. Now we go to the other side. Let's look at the, the sites in light blue on the west side. They're going to do coverage or provide coverage and service in this area. But remember, the main reason for this site was to offload AZ3 Deuce of Clubs. If they're farther away, they're just uh, Vice Mayor also. Now he's on the southwest side of town and he's yelling, trying to serve the same area. It's not really going to provide the level of service and the, the, the needs. It's not going to fix the needs in the area where things are going on. Once again, when we build a cell split, we try to split between the existing sites as much as possible to get all of those users that are on cell edge, just like you're in the side room of the house that you don't have Wi-Fi, 
we're trying to capture those users, get them off of the capacity site because the capacity sites having to yell, use a lot of power, talk to these people. They're not getting good throughput. They're having to yell. They're getting worse battery life. So things are happening. That's why we're trying to get the site in the middle to take care and offload those sites. Uh, we look at the zoom in a little closer. So it gives you an idea. So here's Show High, here's Dusa Clubs, and here's AZ3 Parsons. So if we look at any of the alternative sites in light blue that were brought up that I, that I looked at, this uh, Joe Tank Road, uh, it's going to serve a lot of grasshoppers out to the west. That's really not what you know, we want to serve. They don't really carry cellular phones. We want to serve the people inside. So what this site would do would mostly just be on the outside, not really covering what was going on in town within the area. We do sites up to the north. They're going to offload show high, but he's not the one that's got problems. Deuce of Clubs is the one that has problems. These sites here, they're going to be next to Deuce of Clubs. They're going to be, you know, uh, Councilman Leach and Mr. Mayor, you're going to be both close to each other trying to yell at the people in this room. Not going to work really well. You want to get in the middle where customers are. It's a simple way to look at it. But when you build your house, do you build your bathroom two miles away from your house? No. You build your bathroom where you're going to use it. The people are using the phones in this area. This is the area that's going to help offload DUSA clubs. It's going to provide additional services. We have information from the fire chief saying it's needed. He's having problems. And he's a Verizon customer. All his, all his units are Verizon customers. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. The biggest concerns that the community had was um, the safety, the radiation safety. Can you explain that last time? Can you go into that? Yes, ma'am. For um, us so we can understand that better. Okay. So uh, commercial wireless carriers are all regulated by the FCC. The FCC has come up with a bulletin and, and levels for RF uh, emissions that are allowable and are safe for humans. And when they came up with this level, it to was, extend uh, the conference for 15 minutes. Specific <laughs> absorption rate. So it's watts per centimeter squared. It's the amount of energy that can be absorbed by the human body, and it's safe. Well, they came up with that level. They figured it out. A whole bunch of people, ANSI, IEEE, NCRP, the Food and Drug Administration, the EPA, OSHA, the National Institute of Occupational Safety, all these groups got together, and they figured out what that level was. But well, when they figured out that level, they lowered it by 10, and that's the occupational level, and they lowered it by 50, and that's the general public level. So all carriers have to follow OET 65. Carriers spend a lot of money on these networks. They spend a lot of money on these licenses. They are not going to mess up on something like that and risk losing those capital expenditures. This is very important to carriers. Anytime a site gets modified, it gets an antenna change, an amplifier change, uh, it gets a carrier ad, we have to do a study. Anytime, anytime anything changes, it has to be studied. Another, another person goes on that site with more antennas, that has to be studied. Any change done to the antenna system has to be remodeled, studied to make sure it meets the FCC guidelines. So to give you an example of typical exposure levels, if you have a cell phone, right, remember it's proximity based. We talked about this last time. The closer it is, right, the more it's going to give you. The cell phone is 50% of the general public limit. So right here, I'm getting 50%. That cell site with those antennas, it's 0.1% of the general public limit. Distance, I'm farther away from the antennas. The amount of energy at the antenna versus what's on the ground is 1, 1,000. Very small, very small. The energy goes out from the antennas. It doesn't stand there. It goes away. It tries to cover an area. That energy needs to spread. As it spreads, as I double the distance, it cuts by the square. I keep doubling the distance. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's proximity-based. The cell site, 0.1%. If you have a Wi-Fi router, that's actually generating 0.13. If you have a baby monitor, that's 1. If you have a cordless phone at home, that's one, uh, 15. If you have an FM radio transmitter close to you, that's 100. If you have a police and mobile radio that our policemen carry, those are going to generate even more because they're running on a higher power level. 
These mobiles and the systems are designed to power down. We talked about Mr. Mayor getting loud, the Councilman Hatch getting loud talking. They're having to up their amplification. They're having to talk louder to these mobiles that are out on cell edge. Well, we want the mobiles to be talking quietly. We don't want to use the power. If a mobile's talking loudly, it's noisy. If it's noisy, it's a cocktail party. So same thing, cocktail party. Two people are in there, pretty quiet. You can have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. You can understand each other. A hundred people are in there. You got to start talking louder so you can hear the person next to you. Same thing happens in a cellular network. But the mobiles try to stay low power. The system wants the mobiles to be powered low, as low as possible, because the higher the power, the more it is uh, an interferer. So there's two types of energy, radio waves. There's ionizing and non-ionizing. Ionizing, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays. These are uh, photons. So you go to the dentist, you sit down in the chair, you get the lead overcoat, right? The hygienist walks out of the room, hits the button, you get x-rayed. Why do they do that? Photons are passing through your body. That's not something that's good. That messes with your DNA. That's ionizing energy. That is not a radio transmitter. A radio transmitter is non-ionizing, like a light bulb. All the side effect is on a radio transmitter is heat. You ever notice when you're talking on the phone for a while, it's warm? That's because it's having to generate the radio energy, and it's generating a side effect, heat. Same thing happens at the antenna. So uh, waves that don't affect human DNA, car radios, television, Wi-Fi access points, Bluetooth headsets, cell phones, light bulbs, wireless baby monitors, TV remotes. That's, that's all something that's okay. So if you absorb 50% of the public limit with your smartphone next year versus maybe 5% at maximum of the public limit when that transmitter is active on a cell site. So you're, you're not getting very much energy because it's, the antennas are higher up in the air. So the only established side effect of cell phone radio waves is heat. Um, the FCC limits ensure the amount of heat being generated to post individuals within the tolerance required watts per centimeter squared, and that's what's going on. The two groups are general public and occupational. Occupational is you have a hotel, there's air conditioners on the hotel. There's antennas on top of the hotel. Air conditioner guy goes up, looks at the antennas, doesn't really understand antennas, he's not a radio guy. He's up there to fix the air conditioner. He doesn't know, he doesn't need to stay close to the antenna. Barriers are put up, signs are put up, warnings are put up. It's a controlled environment, that's occupational. When we look at occupational, it's just uh, it's just controlled. The exposure levels are averaged over six minutes, so you can you can be close, but it's done in such a way that there's barriers and signs. That say, hey, don't go here unless you are a radio guy and you understand how to work on this equipment. You can call and get equipment turned down. The second group is general public. You're walking by an antenna. You have no idea you're walking by an antenna. No idea. Uh, I was at a hearing in South Carolina. There was an antenna right in the middle of the room. Nobody knew. I knew, I saw it as soon as I walked in, but nobody else knew. So that antenna has to be monitored, it has to make sure it meets the, the standard general public. I don't know I'm walking by an antenna, I don't know I can stop or not. So the limits, like I said, the FCC made it 50 times lower for the general public. So it's very, very low, very safe. So compare the value of the tower, which is one milliwatt that you're getting versus the power of the smartphone, 200 milliwatts. Big difference. Once again, power difference and the proximity, how close it is to you. Additional information, FCC Bulletin 56, FCC Bulletin 65. If you ever really want to go to sleep, I recommend OET 65. <laughs> it's about 70 pages of a whole lot of dry stuff, but it is the law. It is the rule. Wireless carriers live and breathe this stuff. They follow this to the letter, and they spend a lot of money to make sure they follow it to the letter. There's also FCC poly on human ex, uh, policy on human exposure. There's some American Cancer Society stuff, some New York Times articles, which cites five or six things in the World Health Organization. hope that answers your question without making you glaze over. I'm just glad there's not an article from Fauci on here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I got to liven things up a little bit here. Wake everybody up. Yeah, that's good. No, you've answered my questions, and I appreciate the visual as well as you have put it together, and and it helps us understand. You know, clearly, you know, we had a lot of words, but pictures are worth thousands too. So, 
to kind of clarify some of the questions that that I had and and understand that it's not just for a certain number of people in an area, but it hopes hopefully it will help the majority of the community as well. Thank you. Any other questions of council this time? Okay, we may have you back. Thank you. At this time, we're gonna. Uh, uh, does anybody need to take a break? Oh, that's good. Cool. Uh, just want to make sure she's <laughs> typing and she has to get every word. So. She's young. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll open this to public hearing. Uh, this time, again, if your comments have been covered, uh, if they've been questioned, I do have a couple of uh, questions that I want to ask uh, Mr. Kevin Lowry. He presented a, a document for us, so I do have a question or two for him. If you'd like to come up, let me ask that question real quick. We received this. I just need to know uh, who who's the author of this and if that person is available for any questions. Um, so they're not here tonight. It is Campanelli and Associates and uh, his attorney. Uh, she compiled this 106 page document on our behalf. Okay, thank you. So we could contact them if there's any questions that we have in regards to their comments. I don't know about that. We have retained them and I don't know okay. their willingness to respond to. You. All right. Thank you. That was my question. As we open this up for public hearing, be aware as well as the council, I just want you to know that we're here to protect property rights as well as your rights, as well as the rights of the property owner who owns the property of where the proposed cell tower is. They have rights as well. And I think it's been pretty clear that there are a lot of things that could go on this C2 commercial piece of property. And a cell tower is one of them. There's also many other things that could be built that would never come before us for a public consideration or for a conditional use permit that they could just meet the code and come in tomorrow and build a, a 45 foot building along the back of, of that property line. So understand that their rights have to be protected as well as we're trying to protect your rights as well. So at this time, I'm gonna open this up for a public hearing, a public comment. And when we close the public uh, hearing time, we will not take any more questions unless somebody from the or comments unless somebody from the council specifically asks you to elaborate on something so this is your time now to to talk just please raise your hand when you come up list your your name and your address and we'll share and be respectful of others and their time thank you so come on up man Um, I'm Sandy Goodrich, and I live at 601 North 43rd Avenue, which is pretty close to where they're going to build this monstrosity. So, good evening, members of the City Council. I'm just going to read this so I don't make any mistakes and stuff, okay? By the way, before I start, I have fine connection with my phone all over Sholo, going out to Borden Road. Never had a problem, and I'm with Verizon. So, I'm here to strongly encourage the City Council to deny Young's design application for a cell tower to be built in the neighborhood of Fairway Park at 591 North Clark Road, 3980 West Cooley, Cholo, Arizona. The goals and purpose set in your city ordinances here in Cholo, sections 15, 1 through 69, will be violated if you allow this cell tower to be built at this proposed site. Some of the violations are as follows. Sorry, I get a little nervous. Okay. Even though I was a teacher, I still get nervous. Young Design failed to submit a visual resource assessment, a proper one. Number two, Young Design failed to show or meet the standards for a fall zone or safe zone, any potential fires, potential structure failures, potential ice falls or debris falls. Number three, Young Design failed to use hard data the data they used in their programs is not hard data <coughs> to support their claims regarding an actual location that the gaps in this in personal wire services, a public necessity to this city of ours within the city, and the hard data to support the building of a cell tower at this particular site will resolve those gaps. They didn't show any more reports from other people. So how do we know their reports aren't biased? How do you know what they're telling you is the truth? 
You should have more than one source of documentation to prove that what they're saying at this site is good. These are, there are more violations listed in the document you received from our lawyers. Those are from the lawyers. We've, we've secured a lawyer, okay? As well as explanation of each violation, which they noted in submission documents that Young Design gave to the City Council and Planning Commission. We are the residents of Sholo who voted you into your positions to work for us, the people of Sholo, not big business. If you allow this to be built at this site, you are stabbing us. The Sholo residents have lived in this area for a long time. And I'm a newer resident, but there's a lot of older residents. You're, you're, you're stabbing us in the back if you allow this here. They can build it somewhere else and they'll get just as much coverage. I bet you any money if you had somebody else do the reports. I know that if they wanted to build this in a lot right next to each one of your homes, you would never allow it. And you know I'm speaking the truth. You would never allow a sour tower going right next to your home, right in front of your yard when you sit in your yard. Um, if you allow this tower to be at the site, you are violating your city ordinances requirements and the legislative intent that you swore to follow when electing to your position to follow those city ordinances. Our lawyer's document has presented many lawsuits that won in court against building up set towers based on aesthetics and loss of property values. Therefore, our lawyer's document should convince you of the illegal act you incur if you do not recognize and accept the appeal that we have made. Therefore, I ask you to grant the appeal to have no solar power built at this site and deny uh, Young's design, oh, sorry, Young Design's application. You know, like I said, we don't know their data is accurate. We need, you need an outside source to audit what they said. Then I might believe what they say. Anybody can make up any kind of statistics to support their big business. So I'm just asking you to consider that. And remember, we're asking for empathy. You wouldn't have it built next to your house for your kids to run around and play around, would you? We're just asking that you don't do that either. There are other sites that you can use, and they'll get plenty of coverage. But right now, like I said, I drive around, and I get fine coverage. And I have Verizon on my way. So for I ask that you minutes. please consider what I said. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank okay? you. Thank you. In the back. My name is Jerry Bergstrand. I live at 631 North 34th Drive, which is in the Shallow Golf and Country Club Estates, otherwise known as Bison Golf Course. Uh, I'm here in support of this proposal. Uh, I'm one of the customers that would benefit greatly from better cell service. Right now, we have not very good. It drops calls, et cetera. But I'm also here as a retired real estate appraiser because people have commented about the reduction in property values. Uh, it's my opinion there would be no reduction in property values from this thing. Anybody living next to it has a bigger problem with the commercial zone being in their backyard than this tower being in their backyard. If anything, the improved cell service might help their values a little bit. That's all I had to say. I just want you to consider that there are people that support this in the neighborhood. Thank you. Kevin? Yes, thank you very much. I'd just like to focus on a few points from the document that we submitted that there's four major dangers that have induced local governments to adopt specific setbacks, and they are structural failures, fires, ice fall, and debris fall. Uh, it's been noted that about 40 people a day walk from our neighborhood over to Dollar General. So they're walking through that area where that cell phone cell phone tower is proposed, and then going over to Circle K. Not to mention Mrs. Cash, who lives potentially within the fall zone. So if, I don't know if anyone's able to look at um, some of the pictures, but we have provided exhibits D, E, G, and H, where you can see some of these pictures where there have been, for example, structural failures. The most common causes of the collapse of monopole cell towers 
are component failures at the base of the tower and fires. When such failures occur, an entire 60,000 pound steel tower will collapse with its wreckage, landing at a distance equal to, or sometimes greater than the height of the tower. Mrs. Cash lives 125 feet from within that uh, tower, potential tower. Her property line is 125. Thank you. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, if it were in a place that there wasn't a house that close, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, her danger. So also fires. This is an interesting point that, the, that was made in the document. At least once per month, a monopole cell tower somewhere in the U.S. will burst into flames and the unspecified number of them will thereafter proceed to collapse in a flaming heap. So these are examples you've seen, that you've had a time hopefully to read the document. So you've been able to see the examples, the pictures, the YouTube videos, and the news broadcasts of this actually happening where they catch fire, they do fall, and they do fall from the base potentially. And it has happened, which meets the criteria of evidence. Another interesting thing is an ice fall. So if ice is formed upon these um, monopine limbs, and then they begin to uh, they 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 begin to warm up, then potentially this ice could fall off of this onto people's homes or people walking there. So we already know that pedestrians walk from here to go to Dollar General and Circle K. So there are other places where you're not putting the neighborhood, children, their dogs, and other people walking through there. There's other options. So why would we make this such a high risk? And for homes and potential homes, there in that area. So <clears throat> a natural but well-known danger that is also associated with the placement of monopole cell towers is close proximity to homes or public areas is ice and the genuine risk that can come during the winter early spring when ice which is formed upon installation begins to melt, comes loose and hurdles to the ground. As logic would dictate, if chunks of ice fell from a height of five stories, this is potentially 11, they could seriously injure or kill anyone they strike. Anyone coming in close proximity to the undersized fenced-in compound proposed by Young Design would be well within the ice fall zone of the proposed tower. Mayor, I got a comment, question, or try to slow them down a little bit. I, I just got a real quick comment if I can make one. That document is from the company that we can't contact, correct? That you're reading right now? Because yeah. you said we can't contact them. So I think some other people made a comment that their, their documents could be false. So this is a company that we can't even call and ask any questions, correct? Just curious. I don't know. I mean, I... But just, you said that when you came up that you have this document and you're reading from it, but we can't contact. It. That doesn't make sense. Well, if I've retained them, I have to pay for it. <laughs> so, okay, never mind. Just keep going. But it, to me... All the you're reading that, but to me it doesn't make any sense because we can't verify if all that's correct. Okay. Just well, like you said about them. Thank you for my opportunity. So also, just like to mention on my fourth point is that debris fall. So you can actually have these limbs fall off. So if they fall, they potentially could fall on somebody. We have examples of hard evidence from news broadcasts, which is which has been presented to the city. While the rest of the country is actively enacting and enforcing ordinances to require safe zones around wireless facilities to protect their citizens and the public from the well-documented dangers described here and above, it would behoove the city of Sholo to apply its ordinance similarly. similarly. So I'd just simply like to end by saying that, you know, a, um, a memorandum is simply something that could be used in the future if uh, damages were to occur. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. I did take the time to look at a lot of the the photographs and some of the, the comments that were there and, and look at some of the aging of some of those uh, cell towers that have fallen. There's a lot of, that has changed from design and structure uh, that are a little bit more modern than some of those catastrophes, but they are real and they do happen. And appreciate that. Ian.
Michael McMullen, uh, 401 North 40 Circle. Um, I think if you look at the facts here, if this cell tower fit on a plot of land, you'd have a lot of same arguments here. People don't want the cell tower next to their house, obviously, like the other gal stated. Um, the reductions that they're talking about here are not small. They're anywhere from, I think, if I'm looking at about 30, 25, 40%. They're not like, let's squeak this in here. Um, it kind of bothers me that they're even talking, like we're talking roadways. We can't move it any closer than 200 feet to a roadway, but it's okay to move it 75 feet closer to a residential area. That doesn't make sense to me. It was a visual, I believe that it was a visual corridor that was set up uh, at the time, but wasn't a variation there. We're I talking guess about being able to see the tower versus mm -hmm. the tower falling. Right. That That's a sense. big difference. Yeah. Anyone else? Holly McMullen, and I also live at 401 North 40th Circle. Um, anyone that wants to come by tomorrow, I am going to be remoting in from my hotspot at my house. It works fine inside, so I would highly challenge the data that was presented today. I telecommute to the valley, to a company in the valley, and work from my home up here. I will acknowledge that there is congestion. You see it when you go into town. I sat out on my Jeep out here in my service. Actually, sitting in front of this building is worse than the service inside my home. So I would recommend that before you okay this, that you actually get valid data to support his claims. Thank you. Gentlemen here. Yeah, I'm Walter Hetty, and I live at 4001 West Cooley. Uh, first of all, I'd like to contradict what uh, the gentleman there just said. He didn't say you couldn't call him. He just said he didn't know if they would accept the call. I'm sure since they wrote the document, they would accept your call and, and uh, verify any data that they have. Okay. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring up, uh, with you guys. Well, I'm not a silver tongue talker, so if I stutter and stammer, bear with me. But uh, denying the tower at that location is not denying a tower to be put in. These companies, they have alternate sites that they have picked up in case they can't get one at one of the sites. Uh, and you know they're going to put one in because they can make lots of money off of these towers. Uh, next point I sort of wanted to bring up too is uh, when you listen to company reps, they're real good at, at selling their product. That's why they're employed. So you need to sift through what they say and verify what they say before you make your decision. Uh, I've seen a lot of this in court because I used to present my cases before the magistrate in court. Uh, he's there to sell his product. Uh, and the other point I wanted to bring up is uh, I gave you a map and uh, some photographs of an area that uh, I had looked at. I couldn't really see the map on the deal. My eyes aren't that good anymore. But uh, I don't know if he addressed that particular area or not. Uh, but this site, I did pick up when he was talking that uh, your best coverage is, is line of sight. Well, from the location that you have on that, I'm just showing you that there are other locations. Uh, from that location that you, the map is on, even from the city land, or the uh, Forest Service land, 
you have clear sight into town, you have clear sight all the way out towards Clay Springs, have clear sight pretty much all the way down into here, uh, where the location is, and well, even into this part of town. Uh, plus, you have a clear sight to the tower that's over on Whipple Street, and the tower that's sort of uh, north that uh, Verizon is using now down below. So it would be pretty much in the middle of those two two sites, which he also uh, said is a, one of the uh, criteria that makes it the best, is if it sets in between two of the other towers. Uh, one thing about uh, another site, uh, especially this one that I gave you, uh, is that uh, improvements can be done to it. They can upgrade it without having any problems with with uh, having to increase the height near a uh, residence, or if they need to put in a generator because they lose power every once in a while. Uh, also, on the area I gave you, uh, since uh, the Forest Service and city property is there, uh, the city could receive the. You're referring the to land. the city property that's up by the well, and this was one of the sites that he addressed today. That they have another tower very close to that site. Yes, uh, the one to the north. It would be to your. Uh, I got to think how you're sitting. Well, be to the the yeah, west. That it's you off. Have here off. It's within three quarters of a mile of where this location is. Is one of the towers that they're actually using now. Right. And uh, but uh, and they claim how safe they are. The city, if they wanted to to do something for the public. They could actually put it in there and not even charge them, just lease it to them. Now, I don't know what the rules on that are either. But, uh, but, uh, and uh, another good point about these kind of areas are, is they have no impact on any of the people around. This would be set off well away from the houses. Uh, wouldn't ruin the view of people. To extend there. the conference for 15 minutes. Have I been talking that long? <laughs> but uh, that's really the only points I sort of wanted to bring up on that is just because you deny this area doesn't mean they're not going to come in and put a tower someplace else because I'm sure they've already have alternate sites that they've selected in case they couldn't get this. Companies don't put all their eggs in one basket. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Anyone else? Yes. Good evening. My name is Lynette Bihar, and I live at 2300 North Cottage Trail in Sholo. And I just want to point out this man here talking about OET Bulletin 65. Well, I just want to say that, yes, you can go right online and you can look at it, 70 pages or whatever page you said. Okay, the first time the FCC did that was in 1985. So then when you go on the computer to look at OET Bulletin 65 today, it says August 1997. This is before, what is it, 3G? So there is going to be an effect on the people. And I wrote to the planning and zoning that in 2004, Firefighters were stationed near a 2G cell tower. And when they were exposed to that, they had lack of focus, severe headaches, depression, sleep deprivation, tremors. So the International Association of 
firefight. That is the IAFF. Ma'am, please address the, the council, They please. oppose the use of fire stations as base stations for towers until a study is conducted and it is proven that such sightings are not hazardous to the health of our members. I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Anyone else? Susan Wagley, and I live at 400 North 40th Circle. Um, I would like to uh, somebody to explain to me, like, a dead zone area. Um, when we ever drive by certain areas and stuff, like in Phoenix, and you'll see a cell phone tower, and then it's right by the tower, there's no reception. You lose it. That part, you know, so if they put it there, is our very little local area going to be dead? And if it is, what would they do about it? And then the other thing is that they're talking about that it's fairly safe to you the further away it goes. But with that said, if it's not going to be a real tall tower, how, how safe is it from our little 200 or to 300 yards from this tower? How safe are we going to be from that? So I personally think that it's a lot worse than what they're trying to say that it is. But thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, this time I'm going to close the uh, call to the public. I'm going to come back to our attorney. I'm going to ask him uh, for clarification just on some of the things that if we were to pass this, that would be in violation of our own uh, of our own code uh, if you'd like to you know address that please sure. thank you mayor and council I think uh, count mr. Tregask has kind of addressed this in his opening remarks the code it's not against the code to reduce these setbacks it clearly states in there that you can do the Planning and Zoning Commission had the authority to do that if they felt that the goals of the ordinance were being met so it's not a violation of the code to reduce the anything in the code that requires us to have uh, hard data our city code mm -hmm. nothing in the city code no to meet the goals of the, the ordinance is basically what the city yeah. can I ask a question sure. uh, Morgan okay we can ask for setbacks and we can change the setback but have we done that number of time in city of Shoto or have we just done it once or twice I have to ask Mr. Tregask is that I know we did one just recently. Um, the, was it over here on the the one two? He says there's two times. And was it was I guess Justin? Then was it was it as big as what we're doing the setbacks on this? Is? Uh, Mayor, members of council, the, the previous two uh, towers. That were referenced previously in the staff report uh, that were 80 foot high. Both of those received uh, setback reductions by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, again, on an 80 foot tower, 125%, I'm not going to do the math in my head, but it's more than 80 feet. Um, the most recent tower uh, that was allowed about a 20 foot setback from a residentially zoned property. Uh, the tower before that was also an 80-foot tower, and it was allowed, uh, I think, to meet a 20-foot setback from the adjacent property as well. So those both received 60-foot reductions uh, to the fall zone, and also in the case of uh, most recent tower, very significant reduction to the residential uh, setback. So the tower you're talking, the two you're talking about is the one over by the old Rick's? Or cell one right in downtown? Yeah, so uh, the cell one by uh, the Navajo County Health Department building, uh, that was the first one. The second one was the cell one tower there on White Mountain Road behind the uh, cell one office. 
Thank you. Any other questions of council? You want to address Morgan? Uh, I know I was brought up, and I just want to cover some of these questions about the gentleman said that we are reluctant to. <clears throat> I know our code doesn't allow them to grant uh, planning and zoning at least to to change the setback for the visual corridor of the 200 feet. Can you tell us why that is a hardened set possibly on that particular uh, setback? Although. It is a, an option that this council possibly could require them to go before the variance commission and ask for a, a variance of that setback of the visual corridor still. So I, I don't know all the reasons why the 200 foot visual corridor was set up, but I imagine it's to keep, as you're driving, to keep things from distracting you and, and keeping things away from the road. There may be other reasons why that was done. But in order to, get a variance from that setback, you have to go file for a variance through the Board of Adjustment. You could grant a variance based on several things under state statute, the size of the, the lot, the shape of the lot, the topography of the, the lot. There's different reasons why they could grant a variance. From that. It has to go through the Board of Adjustment. That's set up by state statute. So when variances are granted, you have a Board of Adjustment that grants those, not the council or the commission. Hopefully that, that helps, you know, clarify that that issue there. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Council Member Kelly? Yeah. Hey, if I would have thought of this sooner, I would have asked the question today. This 15139, when did we do this? Does anybody have that answer handy? When did, when was that done? The original code, Justin, do you know? So Section 15169, uh, I believe that's the one that Councilman Kelly's referring yeah, to. Yeah, it refers to wireless telecommunications. Section and that we can reduce uh, setbacks for certain things, but not aesthetics, not visual corridor. Yeah, I didn't know if we had a date on that, but my point is, as you're looking, maybe it Come up with it quick. Go ahead. I've got it here if you're ready for it. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was done through ordinance number 493, which is dated June 19th of 2001. Okay. Um, with that, I would offer an apology to everybody within the sound of my voice because that meant I was there. <laughs> and how in the world. I could set through an idea that a visual corridor was more important than human being is beyond me tonight, okay? If I'm understanding this whole thing, we do not have the power even as the council tonight to move this thing toward the road and get it away from these homes. Um, I, I I have to admit a total failure in seeing what I was part of, unless I voted against it, and I don't remember that. Uh, and then we know you weren't absent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I wasn't absent. I, I can pretty well bet you I was not absent at that meeting. Um, I'm frustrated beyond belief uh, with everything I'm hearing. You you can get on the internet and you can read how this stuff is absolutely deadly. And you can listen to experts that I recognize some expertise from you, sir, that says it's basically safe. I've been hearing about this 5G or G5, I don't even know which way to say it, and how much more dangerous it is and 100 times more potent and all of this thing. Well, I, I don't know, but why a council would set and say, we're gonna respect this visual corridor, 
and how ugly these things can be. And if somebody thinks the ones we have in town that are supposed to look like pine trees look like pine trees, I stand amazed at that opinion. I mean, they do not look like pine trees in my consideration. Um, I don't know, as I read this, I saw they have the, they, Planning and Zoning Commission, have the authority to reduce these setbacks provided it enhances or meets the better need of the goals of these eight policies. And I can't see a single one of the eight that it enhances. I don't know which one or ones the planning and zoning would think that the goals are better met by reducing these setbacks. I, um, I happen to have a little different opinion after 40 years in the real estate business than the gentleman earlier that spoke. However, he's got a credential of appraisal and I don't. But I know a very significant number of people that I work with will simply not buy a property near the cell tower. Now, that could be based on their ignorance of the fact that it represents a health risk as well as they might think it just looks that bad. No, no. But I know they tell me, don't even show me a property that's in close proximity to that. Reminds me of the story of the guy that feared in the mountains, his car thinking a rock was coming down off the hill and killed some of his family in a wreck and all it was was a tumbleweed. Well, you know what? His perception killed family members. And I can't believe there's no reduction in the value based on the percentage of people I know won't buy in that location. Now, I've always heard, you know, you only need one buyer trying to sell a property. And I agree with that concept. So just go find one that is totally convinced that it's completely safe. To extend the conference for 15 minutes. I am very, very frustrated at myself, and I don't know if it's even proper to ask the Planning and Zoning Commission which one of these eight or more of these eight they think goals are met by reducing these setbacks. But if it is proper, I would like to have a uh, planning and zoning commissioner tell me which one of these they think is better served by reducing it. Oh, I don't know, Mayor, if a motion is in order at this time. I don't know if it quite yet. I, okay. may, I want to give just, liberty for Brant to weigh in if he wants to. I will. In a couple of them, please. At okay. this time. Thank you. Thank you. Brent, Mr. You Clark, is there. Okay. Council Member Hat. Brent, did you hear that? Uh, do you have anything to say now? Uh, not right now. I don't. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for uh, the opportunity to speak, but I, I will uh, forego comments at this point. Um, when, yeah, I'll just I'll just hold off for now. Was there anyone who I, I'm sorry for I close called the plug. Was there anybody who called in? Oh, okay. oh yeah, thank you. Good, I should have asked that before. I would have told you. <laughs> Any other comments there? Gene, I'm just going to weigh in a little on what you said. However, the valuation, I know it's been brought up a time or two, but I don't think it holds a whole lot of water in the fact that yes it could either add or distract that that's a given but you made that decision when you bought next to a commercial property that property's been zone c2 for a long time and when you bought a, a property there then anything could be built in that c2 and to say that that that's going to affect my values that may be a true statement but i don't think that it should affect our vote one way or the other because it was a c2 when you moved there possibly and that happens all over that's the give and take of 
location, location, and what can come across the street and what can't be built across the street. We have to protect that when we make those decisions. Too. Any other council comments? Council Member Leach. So, do we have one of these that look like a tree in this town? If they do, I've never seen it. We do it well, number five on Whipple. And it's been there for 15 years and you haven't spotted it. If there was a fence around it, I'd probably seen it. <laughs> Good. Walk away. I mean, I, that's, once again, that's, I, I, I don't make, mean to make funny out of it, but the fence is ugly. The tower, I, I just real quick, I got to tell the story because I was sitting at Flagstaff at a restaurant with my wife having lunch and I seen this guy climbing a tree and I thought, wow, that guy's crazy. But the way he was going up this tree, he wasn't going up the limbs like we did as kids. He was going up this ladder. And then I realized it was a cell tower. So then I drove over there. True story. I know, I know a lot of people think they look ugly. I think the regular towers are putting a 180-foot one in pine top down the road that's just metal. And we, that is ugly to me. But at least we have this. But anyway, after I sat there, I had to drive over there to look at this tower that I knew was a tower now. And once again, the fence was the ugly part of this whole tower. So, and I know we need data up here. I know uh, we lost some service. I think it was Saturday, whether this would have helped that or not. I mean, I switched over my, my computers over to data because I've got a MiFi that I started using. So I don't know if it would benefit. And you're right. Whoever said something about it, or I think she did about it's his perception of his data, his but the same thing with the attorneys, the same thing was, is, is, is that one. So, and then you got to, we sit up here and think, okay, we have 20, 30, 40 people that think this is a crazy idea of putting the tower where it's at. We all probably know we need data, but where it's at is the problem. I think that's what my understanding is. But we have, say, 15, 20,000 people that we're sitting up here represented as well, not just the ones that are here don't like it because of where it's at. We all know we need it, but we don't like where it's at because it's not in my backyard. I don't know, I got to, I, I wish I had, it, it would have fit in my backyard because I'd let them put it in my front yard with my horses, but if I can lease that out there with them. So in my backyard, man, I, 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 I would rather have this there than a 45 foot whatever building there in my backyard. So. There's other things, that, and it still could happen. And that's like the mayor said earlier, we can approve or, or, or deny this, but we could still have a 45 foot building there without even coming to us. And, and that's kind of scary too, because now that is in your backyard. So I don't know, like I said, I, I, I know we need the data up here. I know that for a fact. I think we all do in this room. It's just, we don't want it in our backyard. I wish my front yard it would work in my front yard because I'd let them put it there. I think one thing to, to realize that's changed too, it's not our perception to, to talk about this, that the safety is a, definitely a concern. It's one of the things in our code about the safety and the health. You know, but I think that concerns a lot with the fall zone. When we look at the safety, it's regulated by the federal government uh, with these people. It isn't, it isn't regulated by state. It isn't regulated by the city. It's regulated. Is that correct? There, so it's regulated by the federal government, the safety standard. Probably about a year ago, the state of Arizona passed an, an ordinance that allows 5G to be go in in the right-of-ways. Okay, so they could be putting 5G in, and that's line of sight every 500 feet or so all down the Deuce of Clubs there, and there isn't a whole lot that we could even say or do. It will never even come before the city council or before planning and zoning. It was passed as an ordinance throughout the state. So that's where we're headed. That's where we're going. Those are the things that are happening in our community. I think COVID has showed us a, a great need for cell service, a great need for data. One of the biggest things that we need in the whole region county is how do we bring better broadband to our communities and a lot of things there. Nobody wants anything in their backyard but, but a, of something that's very nice. Nobody wanted the city hall where it was built, across the street when it was built, but it was built there. Many things they haven't. I tribute cell one. We're putting in flagpoles that were cell towers for many years, and it looked good. 
we have given one variance on that 200 foot uh, a buffer to be able to go. It was a very unique situation and a unique case. And I would almost, you know, like a motion to be directed possibly that if we were to approve this, and there again, I'm going to go back to the code, Gene. We say if you're going to deny it, tell us why you're denying it for one of these reasons. But if you're going to change the uh, setback, you don't have to provide a reason as why you agree that it should happen. Okay, and, and maybe that should be stated that they have, because we could have, it's not fair for us to ask, you know, planning and zoning. We probably should have asked that question prior and, and known where it was, or, but they didn't have to give a reason as to why they were willing to change that setback. We do have also the buffer of the property line. There isn't a building on the property line. But the set rear setbacks of those homes, I believe, are probably 20 feet. So you have an additional 20 feet before it hits a structure. You have the, the icing. There again, I think that direction can be handled by is somebody trespassing on the property in order to get a sheet of ice fall on them. They were somewhere that they shouldn't have been if that happens because they were trespassing across a, a private property. If they stayed on the sidewalk and got hit, then that becomes a, a possible liability of, of the tenant of, of that structure. Okay, but as far as those things that are involved, I think it's, it's part of what we have to look at. And is it something that we either uphold what planning and zoning has already passed, or we deny it, or we prove it with some type of additional condition as far as maybe addressing the fencing and maybe recommend that they take it to a variance to see if the variance would, would allow an encroachment upon that 200 feet to move it closer to the street to provide more safety. And that's something that we could recommend to be done. Okay. Council Member Leach. Justin, I got a quick question for you, I'm sorry. I, I, the mayor brought up the ice falling. What, the size of this fencing that well, I wish we can camouflage if, it, if it's approved, the fencing around that, it, what, who determines the size of it? Is the ice falling from that, from this tower, cover that area? Is the fencing, or is it all the same size no matter what tower? Tell me, if, if somebody, I think somebody brought up if a piece of ice falls off of it, will it fall in that fencing area or no? I'm hoping I know the answer. I'm hoping that's why you have to put, I, no, I know it's not the only reason, but Maybe the fencing is the there size. There's an algebraic formula given and the best <laughs> on the velocity of the wind. So we don't know how much the wind is going to be blowing. I that went to Shoal High stuff, School, so algebra wasn't there. So <laughs> I don't know anything about that. And I know the wind can blow ice off of trees. It can a real tree. I get all that. But I'm just curious of why the certain size fencing. So the uh, elevation plan that you have in front of you right now, uh, that shows that the fencing does extend beyond the majority of the tree. Uh, but you can see on uh, one side there that it does not go to the furthest extent of the branches on the other side. So uh, if somebody was walking through this property, um, they potentially could walk underneath those branches uh, and still be outside of that fence. So now you know where I'm going next. So can that be extended, that fencing? or why? So, uh, so there is no fall zone for that? Or no, if so, it's approved. So, no, we don't have, uh, in code, we don't have any type of uh, requirement for understory protection. Well, I, I get that, but we can re recommend that, right? You, you could, uh, I believe, as a, a condition of approval, require that the entire uh, leased area be fenced, including the understory of that uh, monopine. You're making your fence, your ugly fence bigger. Well, hopefully we get. <laughs> hopefully we put a trash can in front of it or something. You're gonna make a bigger a, ugly fence. Put a dumpster in front of it. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. You're welcome. Just... <laughs> Councilwoman Kakavas. Just for clarification, the design of the monopine that's on well five is it? That's a different design than this. Correct. That is correct, yeah. Uh, um, technology marches on. Uh, this pine tree is to a higher standard than the one at well number five.
Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first thing I want to I I like to uh, like to thank Planning and Zoning Commission for you know have to um, make a decision that uh, both John and I in has been on Planning and Zoning so as uh, uh, Brent and um, some of those decisions you have to make um, is um, a little rough. I know when when Junior and I was on it. It was when everything was blowing up and everything else back in uh, 2007, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we had a lot of subdivisions going and there's a lot of different things that happened. So we had some, we made some decisions in planning and zoning that was overturned and changed by the uh, city council. And so we uh, we went and talked to them and, and everything else. So I understand um, and I wanna thank the, the planning and zoning commission for everything they did for this uh, power. The good thing about what's going on with this council is if, if you see there's so so much diversity, um, we can come together, we can laugh, we can joke, we all have different opinions, we all have different uh, ways we uh, project ourselves, and um, but yet we come back together as a council and we serve the people. Um, just like the mayor said a long time ago at the beginning of this thing, we are here to protect the people that own the property to do what they want to do with their property. But we also protect the residents of Sholo to make sure that they're protected too. Um, so I asked some questions tonight just to ask uh, where where this thing can be and where it can uh, handle. The setbacks are 43 feet and 75.2 feet. Um, I asked if the tower being low, is that better? Is it being on the mountain or a little ridge top a little bit better? It seemed like a little ridge top a little bit better. I don't know what well this is. I think number seven. Number seven? It's over by my house. And- um, Your front yard. No, it's my backyard. Oh, my horses are back there. They got a nice fence and gate around them. Um, <laughs> but- um, Not too much. I guess my- <clears throat> My concern is, even with the, like the mayor and everybody said, with C2, we could you could put up a building, you could put up a motel, you could put up another store, uh, you could probably have a fa family dollar next to a Dollar Tree, we don't know. But it might look a little bit better than a big tower sitting up there, but yet that's that's the freedom of what you have. The of, uh, for 15 minutes. I got 15 more minutes? No, Thank not you. you. But, uh, <laughs> You know, you, you could have a, a tower or you could have a nice building. Uh, I think, like Gene was talking about, I think with a building there, if it was another store or something like that, your property value would probably be a little bit better than having a tower next to it. Um, I, I, am, I am not really for, for us to change a setback to justify to put something on a piece of property that uh, is a set stat, uh, set sign of a, of a property. And now we're gonna change it so we can try to get five, 10, 10 pounds of something in a five pound dish. And so to do that, you know, we're, we're, you're saying we're legal, planning zoning was legal to do the setback, we can change that. Um, I'm, just, I'm just not real happy with, um, would have to do this, the setback change. I think, you know, we, as once we set code and everything else and, and people buy, I, I didn't buy a piece of property uh, to put a oversized building on it because I, I'm not sure if it's gonna work or not. So I wanna make sure that everything fits in there. This tower I think is uh, in, the, in the wrong place. I think this, this here by the well seven, I guess is that what you're saying? It, up there by our place. Bunch of vacant property behind it. It's on a plateau, a little bit better. Um, the uh, the dead zones I have, and I'm, I've been a Verizon customer for over 15 years, the de dead zone I have is up there going towards Walmart. There's no dead zone down here. I have no problem getting all my data. I have no problem getting anything else. I understand that we need to have areas where we can pick up broadband and everything else. And to do that, the waves is out, it expands out more than just underneath that uh, tower. And so to get it up a height and get it out, I mean, just look at Nutriosa and Greer and stuff like that. Bryson just put towers in there and, and uh, try to help them out. But at the very beginning, people underneath it had no service. 
it was just, that's just the way it was. I understand about making it look like a tree, hide it. It's still going to be 45 to 50 feet above the top of the other tree. Um, so I, I just have major concern. The one thing is the people that live around it. I understand looking at this tower. We as a city went down through the downtown Sholo, and we took we spent half a million dollars and we took down a bunch of telephone poles and power. Now we did that to make a view a lot better. Now I'm trying we are trying to tell you that this tower is going to be better to put in your yard, but we spent half a million dollars to tear down our trees. But yet we're going to have put this up in front of yours, and so I have a hard time swallowing that. Um, so with the setbacks, with making that, I just I just have a hard time doing it. So that's where I'm at. Any other comments? I think uh, the dead zone issue that wouldn't be a dead zone. I mean, the only with putting this tower in, but you'd still have service there. Uh, de a dead zone is kind of like up where there is no activity at all of where you can be reached and so that becomes a dead zone but once this uh, tower was put in there wouldn't be a dead zone right close by it correct i want to ask a, a question with the setbacks that we have just with safety with health that the better served and trying to think what planning and zoning still at 110 feet if that thing were to fall and even gain 20 feet, it would fall at 130 feet. It still would not reach any structure that we have anywhere in the proximity. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'll go back to uh, that one right there. Uh, that map shows the setbacks to the adjacent property to the north is 93.8 feet. The adjacent property to the west is 124.7 feet. That's the property line, so we have at least property 140 lines. feet there to a structure, correct? That's correct. a habitable structure. So um, Ms. Cash's property is down here. The 124 is measured straight line here. So at a diagonal, you're going to be more than 124 plus the setback on the back. So you'll be over the height of, of the actual uh, tower. Uh, to the north, you're at 93.8 to the property line. Again, there's a parking lot. Um, there's parking spaces. I do not have direct actual dimensions to the uh, structure itself. But in looking at the aerial, um, I would estimate that uh, you have more than the 20 feet between the property line and the structure uh, for the property to the north. Um, again, I'm just backing it up here. So you can see this is the nearest property line. So there, there's a, a fairly significant distance between the structure and the property line itself. Thank you. So as far as safety, we're. I relatively can say that we're still safe in the fall zone of a, of a habitable structure there. And Gene told me that if I get to know him better and I start to think like he does, then I'm doing pretty good. And so trying to think what he was thinking 20 years ago, and one of the difficult things that you have is when you have a 200-foot or visible corridor and that variation that we can have on the backside, try to find a commercial property that's at least 400 foot deep in depth okay is what you'd have to have at least just to meet our code 200 from the visual and 200 from there without any any type of adjustments and when you look at the commercial property a lot of it isn't that deep and that's why some of these sites that you find and you look through through here don't have that much depth to commercial properties 100 200 300 feet is a lot of your depth you get up into some of your bigger developments where Walmart and things are there. So we're going to have this problem going forward wherever they try to look and find and until the city uh, planning and zoning looks at changing and amending our code and, and regulations as more of these towers will possibly be proposed in our community. So, thank you.
I would like to thank you for clarifying <laughs> what I was. I was trying to think possibly, but, <laughs> but but on that side, so that, that's the only reason why I could think that they, we, we would adjust those two setbacks and and not the front one, because as Vice Mayor said, we have been concerned about the visual corridor throughout our whole community to try to improve that and to make that you know as unsightly as possible. But as I shared, that will change soon when they start putting these towers in our. They'll hook them up to the little sides of buildings and then right of ways in line of sight going forward. I don't have any more. I think I've tried to cover most of the topics of the public uh, that they shared, that their concerns that they had and weighed in, and I appreciate that opportunity. At this point, I'm going to look to council if anybody would like to make a motion or if uh, Mr. Park, if you have anything you'd like to share at this time. No, Mayor, I think I'm okay right now. The, of the applicant, is there anything else you would like to share? Um, two things to note, 5G. Uh, there's two ways 5G happens. So remember when the networks went from 3G to 4G? They had the spectrum that they were using that was existing and they just changed the technology on that spectrum. So the same thing's happening in 5G. Right now, T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T are all overlaying 5G on existing channels, existing spectrum. So they'll take and carve out 4G from that spectrum and put 5G in. 5G is already in Payson. T-Mobile's got 5G in Payson. Uh, Verizon's got 5G in Payson. Uh, I think at and is falling pretty close behind. The second way to look at 5G is millimeter wave. And that's what Mr. Mayor was talking about, where the right-of-way poles, you can go set up, put a set of antennas on the poles, and it's something that's gone through a state statute, so there's no local impact. It's just a deal with the right of way. That's millimeter wave. So that's a very high frequency, 28 gigahertz, 39 gigahertz. And it, that area is very small. It's a very small color coverage area. When you get to that higher frequency, you, you start walking away from that light pole and you turn right and go past the building, the signal's gone. Very, very small coverage area. You're not going to see millimeter wave up here for quite some time. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense in downtown Phoenix. It makes sense in downtown Glendale makes sense in downtown uh, Mesa, but it doesn't make sense in the more rural area. The second part about, I think one, uh, one lady brought up the fact that it was written in 1996, 1999 for the, for the OET 65. The FCC re-reviewed that in 2019. They called for a whole lot of uh, people to come back together. Let's re-review this for 5G for the higher frequency band. Once again, 5G frequency bands, 39 gigahertz, 28 gigahertz still non-ionizing energy. So same concept as the radio waves now, like the light bulb, the only side effect is heat. So there's that part of 5G that's going to come along over time, but once again, that's gonna be in denser areas. And you have overlay of 5G, just like when networks went from 3G to 4G, now they'll go from 4G to 5G in the existing band. Whatever technology's riding on those waves, the waves still follow the laws of physics. They haven't changed. The technology is different. In the late, late 80s, when I started in this business, it was analog radio, right? Lots of power, very wide channel. Now there's lots less power, wider channel, carrying more traffic. So over time, as each technology comes along, it requires less power. So it powers down more and more and more. So the amount of power it was used by a site in 1980 was 100 watts for every amplifier. Now it's 60 watts. Well, that 100 watts with one amplifier ran one phone call. Now 60 watts with one amplifier runs 200 connections because it's data. It's more efficient. So the power is going down. The technology gets better. The power goes down. The only thing different for 5G is it's millimeter wave and then on existing band. I just wanted to make sure and clarify that. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us what your background is and where you got your qualifications? Well, I have a double ET degree from DeVry. I got that in 1991. I started in wireless in 1987. I started out as a cell tech. I was working on the transmitter stations uh, doing adjustments. I moved in up uh, into system performance engineering where I do the drive testing, drive around with equipment, take readings, moved to RF engineering, uh, became a lead engineer, uh, worked for carriers up until 2003, and I went over to the to the vendor side. I was RF manager, ran a team of engineers, 
many markets, became a director for one carrier, ran seven states, uh, ran 150 people, got tired of politics and said, I want to be an engineer again. So I went out and became a vendor to carriers. So I've done 32 years in this business. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Thank you. Member Hatch. Uh, Mayor, I'd just like to uh, reiterate <clears throat> the expert community that I read all of what I could get my hands on this last four or five days. The FCC has made some very blunt statements about the lack of danger brought about by cellular. The Nat National Cancer Society's also uh, published information about that. There's not a harm to be had there. World Health Organization, I, I take them with a grain of salt right now, but they've also said that there's not a lot of harm that will come from it. And from what I understand, and I've been away from microwave for a long time, you know, I was on those big tall towers. You could stand and hug one of the panels and not be radiated seriously, unless you stood there for quite some time. Okay. Um, the like it's averaged over six minutes. Um, we do studies. Every site gets studied with a model and models out what the the specific absorption rate is for a, a geographic area around the site. And if you're right up next to the antenna, right in front of it, and sitting there for six minutes, you'll get more exposure. It'll be the occupational level of exposure, but it's still occupational. So if a guy's climbing up the tower like the gentleman you saw, he has to take that into account when he's climbing and the radios have to be turned down. Things have to happen so that person can do that or a man lift or whatever. On the ground around it, 1%, if that. Sometimes two, if it's a multi-carrier tower where T-Mobile's with Verizon, you might see maybe two, two and a half percent of the general public limit, 2%, very small. Very, very small. You're getting more off your phone because it's close to your head and you're getting off that tower. Yes, sir. Any other question? Again, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute uh, put out at Cancer Center the lack of uh, danger associated with cellular radiation. But I, I was more concerned. I went out and drove through a wonderful area looking to see what the aesthetic value was or the diminishing of the aesthetic value. From individual addresses that I garnered from the correspondence that I had, I went to each of those. To extend the conference for 15 minutes, one. That's the last time I'm going to push out. <laughs> uh, In very few cases, was I able to see past the foliage and the vegetation in front of your homes if they're facing that direction. I have the same issue. I have a home that uh, has an exposure to the north and east. And I'm looking at one of those cell towers by the water tank. I just look a different direction. It, I have vegetation that surrounds my home. And I don't, uh, I don't see the problem with it. So anyway, um, I'm very concerned about it that uh, people aren't disappointed. That uh, you understand that we have looked at this. Back in. Anyway, um, I went out through your area and looked to see what I would see of that tower. My concern was uh, another thing that had to do with the wind loading on that tower and the ice fall. Um, it's prevailing wind, I believe, is westerly wind across there. And anything that blows is going to be away from the residential area in the prevailing winds. I know that we get circulators up here that go different directions. But um, I'm not concerned about the health issues. And I, I share some of your opinions about the aesthetics. But uh, 
that comes with progress and, and we're serving a major portion of our public that travels through there and lives adjacent to that area that will get better service. But I thank you very much for your attention tonight. All the questions I had boiling up in my mind, they were answered by gentlemen putting together their presentations. Anyway, thank you very much. We're getting back, yeah. Sorry. Make sure you push one when Welcome you Welcome to the conference assistant. You are the first person in this conference. Please stay on the line. To turn. Hello, Brent. He's not on there yet. Thank you very much. He's here. Brent, is that you? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Thought we lost you for a minute. We had bad reception or something. <laughs> Does anybody find the irony of that, that we're talking about cell towers? <laughs> you guys drop me? Hey, you're on a cell phone probably too, right? Okay, at this time, I'm going to look for uh, council if they'd like to make a motion. Council Member Kelly. Oh, again, I have a question first. Okay. And that is, if a motion is in order, the way this is worded, we're having a public hearing that doesn't state that we'll take action. So I ask our attorney, on the agenda, can we make a motion? Or move an action <laughs> more properly. Consideration of the appeal of conditional use permit. So the options that they shared with us we can uphold the commission decision and approve that as submitted we can amend the commission decision and approve with uh, conditions uh with amended conditions i mean we can amend the commission decision and approve it with amended conditions or we can overturn the commission decision decision and deny the application and if we do a denial, we must state the reasons for doing so. So, as far as legal is concerned, we're okay to proceed with the motion. Thank you. Councilmember Kelly. Yes, in light of not hearing from any planning and zoning commissioner as to what goal was enhanced by reducing the setback, and that is a, re a condition of reducing them, is that it enhances a goal. I would move to deny the application based on the fact that the property simply does not meet the city specification for all setbacks to be met. And if I might, I'd like to go on and say, if it's seriously considered that this is the direction we need to go, we need to change the code. Instead of amending it on setbacks on every, uh, every application we get. When no one can come up with one of these goals that would be better met. That's my motion with explanation. Thank you. We have a motion uh, to overturn. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Vice Mayor. Any other discussion? I'll call for that vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? Aye. See that that failed five to two. Mm -hmm. Council Member Leach. I move to approve CUP 602-0423 submitted by Young Design Group on behalf of Verizon Wireless to allow a 110-foot monopine cell tower located at 591 North Clark Road, 3980 West Cooley, 
that be an AP 309-52-027B, subject to staff recommendations. And if I can put a couple conditions um, on that, and unfortunately, fencing, I think it needs to be in the ice if we can go a little bigger or whatever, and I, I still want to see if there's a way to blend that in. Some kind of stain on the fence. The fencing's fine, because I think they're, it's an ironwood fencing, I believe, but I'd like to see some kind of stained. Case. Put it in your motion. I did. It was it an so. expansion of the? Expansion of the fencing and also some kind of camouflage, staining, whatever on the wood fence. His motion was to uphold, uphold. with the amendments that were approved by the Planning and zoning with condition with additional conditions of extending the fence and also some type of enhancing the fencing through the court. Something like that. Is there a, a second? Second by Council Member Hatch. Any other discussion? You now call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Did that pass five to two? Thank you. I appreciate uh, those in attendance uh, for your time and for your listening at this time. Go to the next item that we have on the agenda here. Council Member uh, Clark, at this time, we'll excuse you and thank you for calling in. Unless you have anything you'd like to go through with a summary of current events. Need to do schedule. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank um, uh, Mel uh, West and his team at the uh, Shola TV station. I've been able to watch uh, the entire council meeting. Um, that's been very helpful for me. I want to thank Tamara and Rachel and, and Mr. Muter for providing this opportunity and making sure that uh, I was able to participate. I want to apologize to those who were in the crowd uh, that I wasn't there to, uh, personally uh, to be able to participate. Uh, unfortunately, my work uh, took me out of state, so I'm uh, here in uh, Fort Worth, Texas tonight and, and through the rest of the week. So I appreciate all the staff making it possible for me to participate and um, hope to be able to join everybody on December 1st. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Before you hang up, uh, we do have a scheduling of meetings that we want to get your input on. Uh, I'll turn that to the city manager for a minute. As you recall, when we had the retreat recently, we talked about um, flooring in the carpet gym, and we're ready to present some options and, and let you know where we came up with. Um, we'd like to see if the council's available possibly Monday at five o'clock to go over those. We have a vendor that's already bought the carpet and we need to get word back to him whether he needs to return it or not. So uh, we're just checking your schedule to see if Monday would work for you. It's the 23rd. Grant Monday, the 23rd, about 5 o'clock. Yeah, I don't think Connie can make it. I'm available, Ms. I'm available, Mayor, to meet that time. So I'll, I'll be back in town, and I have no problem meeting uh, that evening. And could you make it, Connie? But we, if, if, if the council would want, we could do it at 6.30 also. Can't we just do a majority or do you care or something like that? 30 is fine. 6.30, why not? Yeah, 6.30. 6.30 is fine, and Donnie brings pizza. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Okay, we'll Thanks, do it Thanks, appreciate it. 6.30 Monday. Yeah. All right, thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. So we have a summary of current events. I looked at uh, council members for summary of current events. Councilwoman Kukavis. Remind everybody that it's flu season, and COVID is still an issue for our community and the rest of the world so make sure you're getting your flu shot and you're wearing your mask socially distance and thanksgiving vice mayor thank you mayor um just to let you know uh attended a, a main street uh, board meeting um main street has updated their uh web page if you like to go on and see uh all the new aspects of it and it's a little bit easier to get in and out and everything else and it's sholo main street at gmail.com uh go in there and take a look at it and it really looks uh, really looks nice 
Um, during the meeting, a long time ago, we had, uh, if, you, if you go down where the statues are, there's a, uh, an area there where we have bricks in there with names on it, and, and you can put on whatever you want. We're going to uh, start doing another fundraiser on that and uh, see if people would like to put uh, some stuff on a brick and put it in there. Don't have the prices yet or anything else. It's just the Main Street is looking at doing it again. And so hopefully we'll get that uh, process going within a, um, the next couple of months. Uh, just want to go through uh, uh, the, the Christmas um, shop, uh, small shop uh, Saturday downtown merchant uh, poker walk. It's November 28th from uh, 10 to 4. Um, and you can pick up your cards uh, so you can see what, what kind of hand you have at any uh, of these 10 participants that's in this uh, poker walk. And that's Perfect Paws, Birdies. White Mountain Leather Company, Deuce, Deuce's Wild Game Souvenirs, Classic Cookware, Kettles, Horse Station, Books and Treasures, Sweet Home Arizona, and The House. Those uh, 10 places are participating in this uh, poker walk, and you'll be able to walk down through there and, and see what they have and, and have fun, prizes, and stuff like that. Um, the next thing is the Sholo Downtown Merchant Holiday Decorating Event. Uh, Main Street has given uh, a string of lights to any business that they would like to uh, put up. And then if you want to decorate your business and you don't have the time or you don't have the energy or you don't have the stamina to do that, call Main Street at, uh, uh, well, really, Denise, it's 623-340-4131, and they will come out and help you decorate your business for the downtown. Also, about my house, huh? No, not house? your house. It's you got too much fence around it. So, um, <laughs> so also, uh, Main Street's going to be helping with uh, the the Sholo Christmas Parade. Uh, Christmas uh, this year's uh, the title is uh, Magic, uh, Christmas Magic. And after this COVID nineteen, this whole year, I think we need some magic. We need some prayer. We need some help. We need everything. But you can register for this parade. The parade is December fifth. And uh, you can register at the Aquatic Center, and it costs uh, the fees $20. And you can go in there and uh, sign up and be in, in the event. And we're hoping we get a lot more uh, participants in that. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, the big event that we have coming up on the 23rd of, um, of this month. That's the next Monday. Um, City of Sholo, Main Street. Uh, uh, Meals and Wheels Senior Center. Solo. To do a uh, Thanksgiving for the citizens of Sholo. Uh, with COVID 19 and everything that's been going on, we've been talking about this for the last couple of council meetings. Um, if you're a resident and you're elderly and you, for some reason, can't cook, can't get out, can't do anything, please uh, bring a can of food or two or a case, whatever you want to, to the, to the Meals and Wheels Senior Center, and we're giving away three, 300 free meals. And so, and it's first come, first serve, and, uh, it, and that's just for the people that really need help and they can't provide them a, a good Thanksgiving dinner. Now, the ones that can provide, but had had hard times and maybe you know, lost a job, um, slow income, anything that is it's hurting, hurting your family, you can bring the same canned corn, beans, whatever you want to do, peaches, and bring it to downtown chapel here right across the street here on 11th and Huning, right? Yeah. And um, 11th Cooley. And, and Cooley. Cooley and Hall. Hall. And well, one of those streets there, Cooley, but it's all on 11th. We're going um, to be giving away 500 turkeys to the first 500 people to show up. And... Um, this is just a way for this council and Meals and Wheels Senior Center and Main Street and Shola High School uh, kids can say thank you and um, tell you it's been a bad year and, and to give you a little bit of joy in the holiday season. So please, if you have a chance to do that, uh, we would like to, we would love to get rid of the 500 turkeys in a couple hours. Uh, that's what our goal is, and that's what our desire is to serve the, the citizens of Sholo and to give them a, a great time. So uh, 
Those turkeys are frozen, correct? Yes, turkeys are frozen. That's the kind we're doing on the 23rd. That gives you a few days to get them thawed out. Yes. Where should we, you need us here over at the senior center or do you need us over here? Staff, I'm, I just went uh, over here at uh, downtown chapel. We'll just have staff there and you guys. Uh, I would say 1030. So. And please, we just, we, we, uh, we just wanted to say thank you to the residents of Sholo. Oh. So, thank you. That's and it. Anyone else? I'll just share, uh, I just want to thank uh, this community and thank you and hope that you have a very special Thanksgiving. We recently finished, uh, we're not finished, but to date we've been going through our eighth annual community fast. Uh, previous year, we, last year we raised about $23,000 and this year we're a little bit above 40,000 so far. And so we just appreciate the generosity of our community and our businesses and the people and we look forward and we let you know that on the 22nd, Sunday at 6 p.m. on the 22nd, we'll be having our virtual celebration this year. And that website is www.sholocommunityfast.org. And so after 6 p.m., you can go log in anytime and watch the, the virtual uh, celebration that they have. We'll talk a little bit about the recipients last year and what they did with the things that we gave out. So appreciate our community coming together. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a few things to go over. A reminder that the Aquatic Center we, will be closed for three weeks for annual maintenance beginning Thursday, November 26th, and will reopen for business on Monday, December 21st. The Recreation Department is accepting youth basketball registrations for first through sixth graders until December 23rd. A late fee will apply for those who register after December 23rd, but before the end of the year. And if you want more information on that, it's 532-4140. Um, our crews and, and a contract will be working on Christmas lights in the city that will be turned on the, after Thanksgiving for the annual Sholo Shines. And they usually, we usually turn those on the day after the Wednesday before or the, around Thanksgiving time. The focus will be on the downtown area around Festival Marketplace, the Library City Hall, and Long Dusa Clubs, including the Public Safety Building. We have a number of public works projects that we're on, are in the process right now. A couple of playgrounds will be completed by the end of the week at Raylan um, and Archibald Parks. Um, we have the East Hall sidewalk project, Cub Lake Road water line, uh, West Cooley sewer line projects. We have a lot of projects going on. We just appreciate everybody's patience as we complete those projects. There will be a control burn at the Polishing Ponds and, and Pentel Lake north of Sholo plan for tomorrow, so you will see some plumes of smoke on the north north side of Sholo. And it's planned for that if the weather permitting. And a reminder that city offices will be closed next week, Thursday and Friday, November 26th and 27th for the Thanksgiving holiday. And we just want to send out our best and wishes for a wonderful Thanksgiving to the council and to all the citizens of Sholo. Thank you. Any seconds? All right. Well, we got you home before your bedtime, Ed. That's good. Uh, we're grateful for those of you who have been here tonight, those who may be watching on TV, and we just wish you a very happy Thanksgiving and appreciate it. Seeing no other uh, business at this time, I'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Did you say the right city 50? Did you say it right tonight? Are you forgetting it? To turn off the music, press 1.